Hello there and welcome back to the Agostino Zynga show with I, your host Agostino Zynga and this is episode number 639, that is 639 of the Agostino Zynga show with I, your host Agostino Zynga. I hope you are doing well wherever this podcast may find you, I hope you are doing well. How am I? You know how it is, all good, all things considered, I cannot complain, I cannot complain. The last podcast I kind of did, don't get me wrong, but... I think it was kind of therapeutic to kind of get it out there because I have been struggling with motivation and to get myself back into the swing of things of how I was prior to the whole pandy. It's been a bit difficult, but since I've shared some of that stuff, I've had some very um, comforting and illuminating messages from people who have kind of felt the same way. So it's good to see and it's good to hear that I'm not the only one out there who is somewhat struggling to get back on the straight and narrow. And for the most part, I come from it from a different point of view. It's not like I'm saying, oh, I was a completely different person. It's just that I recognize there was this one element of my life where I was quite, you know, regimented. I was quite strict. I was quite headstrong. I did know exactly what I was doing in those sort of circumstances or the typical type of things I kind of, you know, um, devoted my time to. And now I'm recognizing that those things are kind of going by, you know, falling by the wayside. And it was just a way, if anything, to kind of vocalize it, to kind of shook shock myself back into action to make sure that i'm doing the right thing um and i'm kind of putting the best foot forward and that's what i've done and i'm happy about it i'm not gonna lie i'm really happy about that so let's see how that goes and let's see how that progresses and obviously you'll see the progress on here once i get all this buccal fat removed from my cheeks through um non-surgical means you shall see how much work and how much um you know hard work and dedication and motivation are put towards whatever i'm doing going forward so yeah it should be good all things considered it shall be good i'm not gonna lie i was also thinking randomly just kind of you know waxing myself off as i usually do because you know what else um could you do when you have too much time on your hands because i generally do that quite often i'm not sure if you guys do it but i love kind of just thinking about the things i've said or thought about in my own head and kind of chuckle because i think you know i'm the greatest person walking on the face of the earth it's a little bit mad it's a little bit nuts but it is what it is and i was thinking the other day i was like god I wonder how many people out there actually legitimately postpone, reschedule or cancel holidays because they're not hot and skinny enough or they don't have the right drip yet. I wonder how many people they do it. And to me, it's a little bit, you know, I'm not the proudest of it, but because it kind of goes against with this weird sort of adage I have where whenever I buy something new, I never wear it. Like I kind of just save it for a time when I need to wear it, but I don't instantly wear it. I know some of you guys don't really get what I mean, but imagine you went out and you bought a t-shirt, you went to Supreme or something or Stussy, all these kind of brands, or you went to some luxury store somewhere and you bought a nice t-shirt for yourself. Usually you would buy that, I'd assume, with something in mind. Oh, I'm buying this for a wedding coming up, a party coming up. And it's usually the next week, the next day, couple of days. For me, whenever I go out and I buy something, I tend to just buy it and then have it in my wardrobe for ages until I think of a time that I want to pop it out. But it's never the next day or the next week. It's always like a time, you know, far, far, far in the future. And a lot of it comes down to kind of suppressed trauma if you think about it <laughs> when i'm really analyzing it all of these weird things that i do are usually based in trauma because i remember growing up i didn't have a lot of money i grew up you know in a working class family working class environment um you know on the on the real brink of poverty again i didn't realize this until you get older until you start to like travel the world until your friends start to you know until you get start to get friends outside of your little locale bubble right when you start to go to college and university you start to meet friends and people from all over you know the country all over the world and whatnot and you know you try to kind of compare how you grew up or stories and stuff with how you grew up and you're like rah we were actually kind of poor but the good thing about being poor or living in a really rough neighborhood is that everybody is poor too even the people who are quote unquote rich when you look back at it they weren't actually that rich it was just like they had two parents in the house who were working full time and at my point you know growing up some you know one parent didn't have a job one parent did sometimes they both didn't have one so you're kind of always growing up in that kind of you know um up and down not really too sure where the next you know tasty meal is gonna come and all that sort of stuff so and obviously you know the idea of like having the latest greatest trainers was like far flung you just get them whenever you get them kind of thing but one thing i do remember about that was that because of that growing up wise you kind of there was always a bit of like faking it tea and making it sprinkled in there so what you would do is that if you bought something new you wouldn't want to make it look like you didn't have anything by wearing it straight away again this is the mindset of somebody growing up in the hood growing up somewhere poor it's just somewhere i come from where i don't wear my new things straight away 
you didn't want to wear it straight away because if you wore it straight away it would kind of signal you for in, in your head that you didn't have anything to wear and now you've got this t-shirt and now you've you finally got something to wear sort of thing so people will be thinking oh rah you're only wearing the supreme t-shirt now because you didn't have any others before that you could have worn and or everything else you've got is dusty so you would purposely put it on ice and wait for the right time and then pop it out like yeah i had this for time and the flex was actually that you had it for time you know you're popping out now that's the flex which i still think is a bit of a flex now instead of going out straight away and wearing your stuff but if anything the, the bigger flex nowadays is actually having things that you own that are maybe 10 years old or something right that like, or something that you clearly shows that you're a fan of the brand that you're not just on the hype thing for instance if you're a balenciaga fan maybe a, a good sign to be like a fan is like showing that you have that market stripe um a, you know ghana must go type of bag or you have a t-shirt from the first couple of seasons or you have a beanie or a scarf as opposed to the sock trainers or anything or the triple s's because that's just like you know just just trendy things so that weird mindset that i have of not wearing things straight away kind of comes from that kind of you know upbringing but i think it served me well now in my adult age because i tend to generally keep things on ice which i feel like is a good way to kind of accrue a decent wardrobe because you're then adding pieces to it because number one i'm keeping it to ice and one thinking oh i need the perfect quote-unquote outfit to wear in it so now i'll go and get a pair of trousers i'll go and get this i'll go and that and then by the time the look comes together and i pop it out whatever hype that was surrounding that item has kind of died down and i can enjoy it for what i want to enjoy it for and i don't need to enjoy it within the midst of all the noises happening out there in the streets and stuff so it's a little bit dumb it's a little bit weird don't get me wrong um, i'm not going to stand here and say that it makes all the sense in the world but for me it's what i kind of operate on and i think i think that's also the reason why i'm easy and i'm more kind of relaxed and i don't really feel that you know i don't really feel that crazy about postponing or rescheduling a holiday because i don't have the right amount of clothes or the, or the right clothes i want to take with me and i don't and i'm not hot and skinny yet those are the main two reasons and i think i'm okay with it i know some people will look at me and be like oh my god that's amazing that's stupid and obviously it helps because it's a european trip it's not like i'm going flipping to america or i'm going to southeast asia or i'm going to africa or something where it's going to cost you know upwards of like 500 pounds and you know counseling or rescheduling those holidays two times in a row is absolutely dumb but i'm happy that i did it this way around because when it, when i do finally step out and i do finally post my fits on the grm or on on the g-r-a-m you will see you will see what i mean and you'll know that it was worth it you'll know that it was worth it but for anybody else out there who has rescheduled or postponed a date um you know a date even even a date a physical date with another person you know what the, the vibe is because you don't have the right drip or you haven't got the right haircut i've done it before honestly i've grew, maybe because i've grown up in ends where people cared a lot about that stuff and we had to always so i think as well when i'm growing up right i'm going to watch we call it i'm going to um you're going out on the weekend and you usually go out on the weekend kind of pop out to a house party you maybe go to like a rave somewhere they're usually in weird places like there was this place in beckton called that like st mark's which was like a community center kind of church type of vibe and they you, you had they had this community hall where they throw raves in there and it'd always be fights and stuff and madness would go and people get stabbed and whatnot but the raves were fun right and all the girls would come out and they you know they show out they'd be dancing you'd catch a little quick wine and stuff get a little rock hard bone and go home right and those are good occasions because you usually get a chance to like meet all these girls from your area that you never saw because usually you know you leave the area to go to school before what nine or something you come back at three four i don't know sometimes it depends some people just they grew up in homes where because i remember there was a few girls in that area super especially some of the more prettier girls for every reason they grew up in a weird household maybe they were mormon i'm not too sure but their parents wouldn't let them out so you never got to see these people at all so the only time you get to see them sometimes on the rare occasion was a party because maybe the girl lied to her parents and said she was going to her friend's house for a sleepover and then bang she pops out it's a mad outfit you know the parents would be flipping have a heart attack if they saw it and you get a chance to see them in real life so those occasions were big right because you're literally like i'm saying you're getting to see people that you never would get to see day to day because they're always in hiding their parents keep them under lock and key they're not allowed out anyway they've been indoctrinated whatever religion they're in whatever the reason is they just don't come out so the least you could do if you see it, the least you can do to kind of prepare yourself and to kind of you know give yourself the best opportunity to get a bit of action was to get a fade was to get a haircut but again back then these things cost money do i have the money when i'm under 15 years old of course not i'm not trapping not doing anything i'm just a, you know i'm a i'm, a, I'm an abider of the rules kind of guy but i have all these friends that do all these dodgy things but i'm obviously i'm too scared to do it so i just don't have any money so you're there trying to get haircuts you can't get them i remember this is also around maybe around a period i started to cut my own hair for a little bit 
Yeah, that's when you know you're growing up in real poverty. When you're growing, cutting your hair at that sort of age, just to get something. I mean, I remember I'd give myself little shape ups. Like you'd get the little razor and you'd give yourself little, little tiny shape ups. Or sometimes if you got a really good haircut, I think you'd do, if you got a really good one, is that you would kind of use it as a sort of base, as a template to go over the lines and you'd keep that topped up every couple of days or so. And that was the only way to kind of, you know, make sure that you present yourself pretty well. And then of course, the standard thing, I had like maybe what? two tracksuits maybe three i had like good ones um a couple of ones i bought in like dagnum market if you know that if you know about those vibes big up like express such that like button if you know about dagnum market back in the day if you know about hackney market back in the day bought dorsted market back in the day just boot sales in general you'd get some good stuff where maybe the you know the kids maybe had grown over or grown out of those tracksuits and you'd find some for cheap and you'd kind of wash those things you know i, I remember having tracksuits that were like navy no that navy blue you'd wash them so much they turn like purple like a weird purpley type of color because i'd be washing them hand washing them in the sink all the time and stuff and drying them and making sure they're neat so if anything again this is the thing about growing up in poverty it's a bit hard it's a bit you know it's a bit sad and it can bum you out but if anything it does give you good practices it does give you good habits because i for the longest time would never be seen outside of like a dirty t-shirt i'd always iron my t-shirt iron my underwear because i didn't have much so you have to make the little you have shine like gold so i had like so I don't know if you guys are the same, but I had like going out shirts. So I had shirts I'd wear to go out in. I had shirts I'd wear to play football in. I had shirts to wear to go to church with. Like they were separate. And I'd make sure that I'd wash them like on a particular day during the week. So you'd have them dry by the weekend. So if anything did pop up, someone said, hey, Ag, there's this house party going down in East Ham. Come, link us. You could go and you've already got an outfit ready to go. And again, it's not the best, not the shiniest, but you got that going. I remember back in the day, this is again, the ghetto shit. Back in the day, right, we had them, you know, Air Force Ones, you know, they get banged up. And people, I think, do them nowadays. But one of the tricks to keep your Air Force Ones alive was to chuck them in a the wash. But when you chuck them in a the wash, sorry, washing machine, they'd come out and they'd be a little bit, you know, crank. They'd be a little bit like, whatever, right? They'd be a little bit crumpled up. And some of the cracks would be showing up gray and whatnot. So what you do is that you get Tipex. Tipex, yes, Tipex that you use to kind of, you know, erase little things on letters and forms and whatnot. And you would Tipex the cracks. Or what I used to do, because I had paint that I stole from school, I would take like, um, I forgot the paint, what is it called? Uh, not oil paint, the other paint. I forgot the paint, the name of it. But you take that white paint and you'd kind of put it on the cracks. Or sometimes you'd go and get this other paint that people used to use to do shoe customization with. I think it's called like Angelius paint or something like that. So I think it's the name. You used to buy on eBay. You used to get shit from America back in the day, right? And I think they sold them in the UK, but back in the day, it was really hard to get a hold of it. And you'd get that paint and you'd kind of like mark all the edges, all the little cracks. You'd cover them up with this little paint so that you would kind of you know you'd kind of make your stuff bang or some of my friends what they'll do is they'll just take a whole brush of white paint and cover the whole sole with white paint on it and just kind of let that dry because sometimes the sole would be the one that would kind of give the age away because of that i forgot what it's called i think it's pva whatever they or uv i forgot what the material they use for the base of an air force one but after a time it would yellow you know how they like to do it now with it make it look trendy to yellow back then it was like a thing now you didn't want it to look crap so they would yellow a little bit so you'd cover the whole thing in a white paint to kind of make them pop or bang a little bit like crazy and if, if anything i think to myself now i actually just kind of um attraction i have to all black shoes was back then too all black trainers is a good reason why a lot of people used to love all black trainers in the hood was that of course if you're up to no good you could you know wear them with an all black outfit and look like a ninja but the other thing as well is that they looked you could extend a life cycle of an all, all black shoe more than an all white shoe if you wore it you know what i mean like you could kind of you go you put black leather shoe polish on a black shoe buff them up and they look bare shiny like some african uncle sandal but to you they look brand new again all these weird little tricks because you knew you weren't going to get another pair for a long time so those things kind of always played into mind so you know as much as it is a bit of a, a loser thing that i'm postponing a holiday because i don't have the right drip and i'm not hot and skinny enough the hot and skinny you know exactly what the vibes are once this book of fat's been removed and I'm, I'm running out there again and i'm doing my thing and i'm i'm you know i'm a cheat i'm down to the low 200s you know what the vibe is especially when i put the drip on but in general when it comes to the outfits and stuff it's something that i can never let go even even at my big age as cringy and as embarrassing as it is but hey we've all got our things and we've all got our things then I stumbled across this thing on the shade bar and I thought it was pretty funny and I think it's kind of cool and pretty funny but also as long as the necessary goal is being reached it's all good so this is 
clip going viral on the Shade Borough, which features Miss Banks, Steph, Steph London, and Thames, I think are there, right? Yeah, Thames. And it says, um, it's been looking very lit in Ghana recently where UK rappers, um, sorry, Miss Banks, Steph London, was seen partying in Nigeria with Nigerian, sorry, singer, songwriter, Thames. And as most of you should know, if you don't know, for whatever reason, Ghana has now become like the new hot destination place to go to if you're somebody involved in the, you know, in hip hop kind of urban environment here in the UK. And everyone's kind of traversing over there. I've seen a lot of American people going over there. Of course, you've seen Meek Mill do his thing. Chance Rap has been out there for a while with um, Vic Mensa. But it's definitely been popping off as per lately. I think I saw a clip of Lethal B from Morphire Crew. He uh, He's doing some property development out there as well and generally it's just become like a kind of a place to kind of go to um for the holidays and whatnot to hang out and people have been turning it into a new kind of hotspot after all the hype of dubai and places like that which has been quite cool to see of course and for me growing up in the hood or growing up in the end it's pretty nice to see this because i do remember there was a time when i was growing up where to try, basically being proud of your being proud of your African roots was sort of kind of looked down on. People would go out their way to lie about where they were from. I remember this was the era where a lot of Nigerian girls, right, especially the lighter skinned ones, especially the ones that used to wear contact lenses, I remember because I dated one, that would uh, say that they were half Brazilian, that they had Portuguese in them, like loads of, especially, don't get me started Angolan girls. Angolan girls are the worst, but I remember Nigerian girls specifically, especially the lighter skinned ones, honestly, the fairer skinned ones would say so many lies about where they were from. They'll mention Dominican Republic, they'll mention Trinidad Tobago whatever nonsense I'd mention but they wouldn't be proud of their African roots and some of them will change their names whatever it may be just crazy nonsense stuff and even if it was a time to go back home like imagine if it was like um what would you say imagine if it was um imagine if it was like christmas holidays and stuff you had to go back to visit your family they'd be like oh i have to go back home to my family they'd be down about it they wouldn't up they wouldn't upload or share any pictures or something they wouldn't want to talk about it much when they came back like it was an absolute horror but there was a real real weird vibe around the whole thing no one wanted to be proud of the fact that they were african at all zero and i felt like in recent years a lot of the change has come about because of the music which is weird because i always thought it would come because of sports the, the better african players did in europe the better african teams did in certain competitions at like the world cup and stuff or african nations or certain nations it would kind of spur people to represent and to be more patriotic but i feel like the music has done the best thing to it and i think the music has also been a good thing because it's sort of unf it's sort of unfiltered and it isn't compromised. It's not like we're getting a sanitized version of Afrobeats here in the UK. We're getting some of the biggest people in Afrobeats or Afro pop coming over to the UK and dominating. And we're also getting their influence in our music. So it's not even like we get like a sanitized version. We're getting the greatest version of it possible. And of course, with the plethora of flipping African people here in Europe, it's only going to get bigger and better. So that's been great to see. But I'm not going to lie. I actually enjoy and like seeing this thing because I think as well, another thing that I was thinking of that I thought might be the reason for it is the whole Brexit thing maybe partially to do with brexit in that for whatever reason as having checked upon flights and stuff because i'm always you know what's that thing called i always keep um some destinations you know tracked on my google flights thing i think you should check it out if you haven't before google flights is basically like a sky scanner where it basically gives you like a list of different flights and different airlines and what they're charging and you get to basically see and keep an eye on you know what the charges are all across the board and i that generally kind of track some and ones i always track all the time are like you know london las vegas london la london new york london florida you know miami so all these type of places i kind of always checking them just to kind of see the flights and it's been a while since i've checked last maybe like a couple of months but i remember when i was checking it a lot i would never ever see anything under 500 and i remember there was a time prior to the pandemic and prior to brexit where you could sometimes get flights to you know jfk for like 350 if it was like a random kind of week you know a random month somewhere in a calendar you could get a flight to america a flight to new york city for 350 now i can't see any flights to america for under 500 and i, I remember also there was a time where i went to bali and i think that the flights to bali were like 
400 or something crazy like that and now those fights are probably you know the minimum is going to be 400 so clearly i think those destinations have priced a lot of us uk people out of going to those holidays because essentially if you're paying 500 pounds to go to america you can't really go there just for the week you kind of have to make it a two-week trip to make it a bit worthwhile and you know to gather up all the necessary people that you need to go to a holiday that costs 500 flights isn't going to be that accessible even if you are as rich and successful as these ladies are as miss banks teflon Don and Thames right they were all rich and successful people but still you want to make you know even if you're rich and successful doesn't mean you want to spend two grand on a flight just because you want to spend two grand sometimes you want to make it worthwhile so if you can go to a place like Ghana you can maybe take a couple of your friends along with you and maybe spend in total 5k on the flights which is still nothing if you think about it and then have you know great you know great accommodation great scenery be amongst your people also which is something that I think doesn't kind of get spoken about enough the fact that you know black people especially when we're in social environments there's a particular energy that we bring to spaces that is quite nice to see that reflected in other places as well where you go somewhere and you're not the minority for once which is like it's not it's, it shouldn't be an issue but i know for myself having traveled a bunch around the world as much as i try not to kind of keep it in my mind and i try just to enjoy myself it's something that you can't avoid when you go to certain places where you realize oh right i'm one of the only people here that looks like me right when i went to zagreb where you go to places like bali i went to places like nicaragua you realize okay cool i'm just on my own here and it kind of stick out like a soft farm it makes you feel a bit uncomfortable and you don't necessarily kind of catch a vibe where i'd imagine going to a place like africa but going to a place like ghana specifically where you are legitimately amongst your own people it must be quite enrich it must be quite nice to be relaxed in that social environment even though i'm sure to african people other black people that come from europe stick out like a soft farm i'm sure of it there's you know they can tell us they can tell us apart from a mile away i still think it's quite a nice thing to have and to experience in real time um this kind of renaissance taking place there in africa and i'm really really loving it um, and everyone that's kind of going there and kind of making it hot and i'm sure the making it hot thing for some people is not going to be the greatest i remember i saw a clip just now of french montana on the math hopeful podcast talking about how he's a bit you know pissed off that sam bars is gonna be you know baited up by next year or something because drake french montana fabulous and stuff have been heading over to sam bars as their sort of new destination holiday destination i'm sure people have now kind of planned their next summer trips to go to sam bars because of how they've been kind of blown up on their platforms and i know a few people on my timeline who have been going to ghana and stuff and having a great time and meeting up and linking up with people that we kind of you know maybe share in common and you know i can sit here in bay say yeah it is annoying to see but i'm not gonna lie to see people legitimately standing and being proud in their africanness and kind of going out there and enjoying those holidays and it's essentially you know i've grown up in areas where legitimately the only time you'd go to africa is if your parents forced you to or if you're in trouble or something so the fact that young people are leaving london and going to a place in africa is a big deal um on the, of their own volition to go and hang out and have a good time is absolutely sick to see so hopefully this continues continues going forward and we see people going to far-flung places across africa right? i mean tanzania zimbabwe mozambique angola kenya botswana whatever it may be they're traveling all across the place and kind of making it a bit of a cultural destination to go and travel to because unfortunately we're now being priced out of the americas the southeast asia's have probably the same sort of vibe so if you can if you are going to travel 10 plus hours why not go travel to see your people like i was thinking the same thing when the whole ama piano thing was popping up i was like you know what i'd love to go to south africa for a week or two weeks and just see what that vibe is like actually in the locale where that music is made and experience it in real time and hopefully that happens sometime in the future but yeah big up thames big up um steph london big up miss banks out there making it hot making it big and clearly having a good time and hopefully we see more of it going forward hopefully we see more of it going forward and then moving on from that i wanted to quickly touch upon this which i think is absolutely hilarious let's just go to a shade bar again and it says seven men have been held in custody following a raid in every's lingard lane warehouse in brinton in brennington sorry stockport the seven men between ages of 18 and 55 have been suspected of stealing two twenty thousand pounds worth of goods and have been held in suspicion of burglary handling stolen goods these crimes come shortly after every themselves issues a formal apology following a string of delays and failed deliveries across the country the firm has cited staff salt it is um royal mail strikes and bad weather as reasons as to why they struggle to fulfill deliveries um leading to the busy christmas period i call cap on all of that but we continue the funny thing about every 
is that prior to every being called every they were called hermes i'm not too sure why they changed their name the legit reason behind it but i'm assuming some of it had to be because of the bad press and bad pr hermes would get terrible terrible reviews um for their delivery right like just horrendous because they'd missed deliveries they say it was scheduled it wasn't scheduled there'll be those viral clips that would go around social media showing warehouse kind of stuff literally flinging parcels from one side of the warehouse into an empty van clearly not taking you know we know it's happening but they were going ott with it and just acting crazy now with every i feel like they have way more confrontational people delivering their stuff because i've never in my lifetime usually even had any conversations with people that deliver your thing right they either deliver it make you sign it or they leave you a card but there's not a lot of communication or a lot of con you know conversation going on but most of the every people i've seen delivering these parcels they love a good argument they love like to get pissed off they love to get rattled they want to have a back and forth with you and stuff to the point where maybe you're close again to blows and i'm like what the hell is going on here maybe it's because they don't actually you know vet or they don't actually have that much of a criteria when it comes to being a delivery person these sort of companies which make sense because they just want to get things to you as quickly as possible and usually if all things being equal they can do that and i'm all for it as well especially in times we're living at the moment get your job get your money up but the fact that this happens on a consistent basis is a bit scary i've had the same issues happening in my building that i live in for a while where a couple of the every guys have been a little bit confrontational a little bit too aggressive a little bit too aggro which is not you know nice obviously especially if you are imagining a, like a single girl living in an apartment having this guy argue and shout at you and tell you that you're not doing something right or whatever it may be or scold you then you're going to be in fear of ordering from that place again and you know because you don't want them to deliver it with every you don't want the guy to kind of kick your door in while you're in a shower or something mad 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 stuff but the stealing of the packages i feel like is definitely something that's kind of been felt around the globe in general because i feel like since this whole post-pandemic recession financial squeeze we've been in i feel like i've seen more instances of people stealing packages than ever before that never used to happen before honestly I, my, my life i feel like people didn't used to steal your parcels now especially in the building that i live in because the lift keeps breaking down all the time a lot of the delivery guys i guess in their um i guess in their rules um whatever delivery company they work for which is quite nice for them if the lift isn't working they're allowed to live the parcels downstairs because i think some builders are different some buildings i don't know have lived in some apartment blocks where they have all the post boxes downstairs where so they're basically little little keys that can open and put your stuff in there right um I've, yeah post box area things whereas in my building you know it's an apartment and you have to go up to eight people's doors and kind of push things through doors that's a bit annoying but i guess the good thing is that they can't be told them hey if the lift is not working just leave it at the reception but obviously in the building i live in if you just leave all the parcels on the reception that means anybody walking in and out can just take one and the cameras aren't the best and there's no record of what parcels got left so someone could just pick up something that isn't theirs and it's just theirs or somebody could walk behind somebody from the outside pick up a couple of parcels and then dip so it's it's you know there's there's a constant threat happening and i'm seeing when i've checked you know my building's facebook page from time to time which is definitely full of karens people reporting the snitching on every sort of flipping thing i've seen way more people reporting stuff go missing from downstairs than ever ever before and i think a lot of it has to do with the financial squeeze people are trying to get whatever they can out of any situation that, they, that, that they're in and squeeze any extra bit that they can because it counts so if you stumble across a because the, the, the bad thing is that you could stumble across a parcel and it could be a parcel from flipping what's it place from sheen or something right a dress for like 19 pounds that's not gonna you know you're not gonna move the needle with that or you can open the parcel and see oh right it's an iphone oh it's this camera whatever it may be and you can just flip that and that extra 200 pounds is going to go a long way it's going to help you with your light bill it might help you with your gas it might help you with your weekly shop so the incentive is there so i'm not surprised this is happening quite often to be honest but these every guys honestly they're the worst i have to be honest they're legitimately the worst and i think a lot of it has to do with the fact that there is no um you know job requirements or the only requirement that you need to work there is probably that you have got uh, you know you, you, you've got functioning limbs and you're able to pick up boxes and stuff apart from that it's everything is a go so all the all these sort of like uh, you know effects of people stealing things in the warehouse and at your store or you know at your abode is definitely something i'm not surprised by but yeah pick up every um hopefully you guys go under because because you're absolutely terrible at what you do and hopefully the guys that work there get another job because they clearly don't need, want to be there i get it i get it i get it then i went to move across to this tom hanks mentioning 
the ba- whole Nepo baby discourse thing, which doesn't seem to stop. It's funny because I feel like this is the one thing a lot of these sort of like uh, Hollywood elite people seem to be really annoyed by and, and really willing to sort of die on the hill to kind of set the record straight. They really want it to be known that, hey, we are not nipper babies. This is what it is really about, blah, 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 blah. More so than they would with any other topic, right? When it comes to racism, when it comes to even um, the gender pay gap, you know, inequalities or opportunities, things, you hear them, they're completely mute. When it comes to um, whitewashing of roles, they're completely mute. But when it comes to the nepotism baby discourse, they want to weigh in and let you know their children are not nipper babies. They're just suffering from success or something, right? It's absolutely maddening. But, I thought Tom Hanks' reply to this was really, really funny and interesting. This is courtesy of Men's Health, and it says, Tom Hanks has some things to say about the Nipu baby discourse. Um, it says here, Hollywood actor and mainstay Tom Hanks has been such a consistent, confident president in pop culture over the last 40 years that he has earned a nickname America's Dad. But he's also an actual dad of four. There is actor Colin and actress Elizabeth from Hanks' first marriage to Samantha Lewis, then white boy summer advocate Chet and younger son Truman from his current marriage with singer Rita Wilson all of Hank's children have carved out careers in entertainment Truman is about to make his acting debut opposite his father in a mad called Otto in which he plays a younger version of Tom Hanks's character in a recent interview Hanks addressed the idea that his kids are benefiting from Hollywood nepotism he said the following look this is a family business this is what we've been doing forever it's all what our kids grew up in we have four kids they're all creative they're all involved in some kind of storytelling or some some brand of storytelling and if we were plumbing supply business or if we ran a florist shop down the street the whole family would be putting in time at some point even if it was just inventory at the end of the year the time the, the thing that doesn't um, change no matter what happens no matter what your last name in is whether it works or not that's the issue anything anytime any one of us go off and try to tell a fresh story or create something that has a beginning and middle and the end it doesn't matter what our last names are we have to do the work in order to make what a true and authentic experience for our audience and it is much bigger task than worrying about whether somebody's going to be uh, trying to scave us or not now this is funny again because it completely misses the mark like i said previously in another topic or another podcast regarding the nepotism debate Generally, I feel like the nepotism debate wasn't necessarily for the elites and for the people who have the nepotism kids to chime in for. It was more so um, an opportunity to re- provide some respite to people out there who don't, you know, have the privilege of nepotism and also to kind of reaffirm the authority and the control and the gatekeepish vibe of some media platforms because I think they've been running with this way too far. So for the people that are not involved in nepotism and don't have that privilege, it's nice to know that sometimes because somebody's your age mate but they're way further in their career it's quite comforting to know that oh this person's the child of this person of that person that's why they're further along in their career because they've been granted opportunities and you know privileges that you would probably never get that allowed them to kind of show and prove their talent because the talent thing we can you know is another thing but let's let's generally say you're all you know everybody's above medium media you know mediocre level of a talent If that's the case, then the only thing that's going to be separating people from getting opportunities will be the fact that, you know, whether you get opportunities or not to to kind of show and prove your talent. So if you if somebody tells you, hey, this person that's your age mate, that's 21 years old, has a hit TV show under their belt because of this, that and the other. It can be quite comforting when you're coming up and you're struggling to get gigs or you're struggling to go to auditions and you've got two jobs and a kid. It can be quite comforting to know, all right, cool, this is why I'm not there right it doesn't excuse the fact that you're not there it doesn't give you a reason to bash that person it's not kind of um yeah like i said it's not an excuse thing it's not something to bash but it should be quite comforting so that you know your journey is a bit longer and you know over time eventually hopefully if that's in your destiny you'll get to where you need to get to but it kind of should stop the kind of comparison sort of um what about me um, woe is me jealousy type of thing it should kind of give you some level of comfort okay cool this is why they're there let me just keep my head down and keep it moving for the media and for the platforms out there who are pushing this discourse way too much i feel like also it's a weird way for them to sort of um re-establish um their authority and their gatekeeper 
um, title so they can say, hey, look, we are the real king makers and king and queen makers in this um, industry. We decide who has a career, who doesn't have a career. Because even if you have nepotism, we still have to present you the opportunity to present your, your talent. Yeah? So if you're the son of Tom Hanks, typically son of Tom Hanks doesn't mean you get roles, but it means you can audition for them. It means that you can maybe see scripts that other people can't even see. Loads of other things kind of go into that. But they still have to decide to choose you. That kind of choosing thing. I saw already with this whole Golden Globe stuff. You see people crying on the Golden Globes and sharing these really emotional stories about being out of the industry for so long and about being counted out. And now they've got this moment in the sun. And you can clearly see that it means a lot to them. But a lot of them are kind of... And then I could understand why so many actors hang on because they've all got that hope that they're going to have that redemption story that they're going to be that person on that platform on that stage sharing the story of like how hard it was and how they just stuck stuck to it they kind of hunkered down and they finally need to get to where they need to get to that's what everyone's kind of hoping for so clearly for the media elites they want to re-establish their dominance and their authority especially with people on social media these days with the tiktok stars and whatever it may be and people kind of making it their own way and sort of kind of carving their own path they're like no 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 no, no. if you really want to be in if you want to be accepted in our industry in hollywood we decide who are the king and queen makers going forward but i honestly do think for the people who are debating it people like tom hanks and stuff they miss the point or the mark because it's just not their reality in it and you can kind of understand it but they just don't understand that coming up without any access to these opportunities and what it may look like for somebody is just completely different and people who have don't have the opportunity or the privileges should be annoyed by it it doesn't excuse the fact that they don't have the opportunities it doesn't excuse the fact that they're not where they need to get to in their, in, in their industry but you know being a little bit aggrieved that you don't have the same privileges that chet hanks does or the same chances to mess up or to basically excuse from your obvious lack of talent or just kind of existing it can be a little bit annoying but i'm also sure being a chet hanks can also be its own version of hell where you're essentially living under the shadow of somebody like a tom hanks being your dad which is absolutely crazy because how are you ever going to surpass or meet whatever achievement he has met in his life everything that you do is going to be compared to him and um, you want to carve your own name but people won't let you kind of not forget your last name and you also get presented with opportunities and chances you never asked for just because of the name that your dad has but also he had to work for it you know so there's that weird kind of vibe because he obviously worked for it to provide for his children and of course any person out there if you have kids you know the, the last thing you'd want to do is for them to suffer the same way you did even if you want them to, you know to be street smart you don't want them to grow up in the same you know poverty or the same points of desperation or the same struggles that you had if you can afford not to why would you do that of course you wouldn't so it makes complete sense why you're given opportunities but the idea that these people are going to be you know would be where they are regardless because of hard work is just insane because we know that isn't the facts but you also know your name doesn't always count for everything just because you have a name doesn't mean you're going to go anywhere in life it could be like i said it could be some kind of prison but this lack of understanding what it's like to be like a regular person out there can make some level of sense because they're quite detached and they're quite airy fairy up in the air and i actually do like this to be honest i gotta be honest i like this approach because from tom hanks what you see is somebody who's not really that kind of you know plugged into what the regular person's going through they're a bit detached um they don't really know the plight of the regular schmegular person out there which is okay because you're fucking tom hanks you shouldn't know what regular people are going through but i feel like before the longest time these people try to pretend like they knew what the average person was going through and they try to emote to it they try to relate to it they try to kind of you know larp as they were kind of regular folks to when you're not you've grown up in a lack of privilege you have people kind of lapping and doting over you from the beginning of time no, people surrounding you that are yes men you've, ba you've basically been able to play adult pretender for the majority of your life and all these type of things it's no wonder that you're a bit head in the clouds that makes complete sense but for the people out there struggling and trying to make it forward in life it's good to know that these people nepo babies in particular do get opportunities based on their last name and that some of them aren't there's going to be on the same level that you are just based off that and they get presented with opportunities that you would never do but it also is an excuse for you not to work hard you still need to show up and prove and present yourself and in this life that we live in nothing is fair just because you know even the, the, the idea of an even playing field is never ever going to exist so you always have to overcome and battle your own things to kind of get where you need to get to and in general to me personally i feel like the, that journey even if you don't make it this is a thing that people don't like to talk about but i feel like that journey is worth this weight in gold because i'm a big stickler of having good fun interesting bar stories to tell and what what is a better bar story than trying to make it in an industry that's intrinsically hard to make it in that doesn't have any direct route that's full of abuse 
um, manipulation, um, greed, assault, all these sort of nonsense things, all these sort of landmines you have to you know dodge in any kind of way, identity politics, politics in general, um, self-confidence issues, mental health, and you finally get to the ending point where you achieve something, where you get paid for something, where you get on a TV show, where you maybe get something submitted to Tribeca, whatever it may be, that journey should be worth it in itself. Even if it doesn't end up being a big, a big, big success, the fact that you did it should be enough in itself because I can't imagine how hellish it must be trying to um, match or surpass what Tom Hanks did, knowing full well you're never going to do it. And knowing full well, even if you did do it, everyone was, would attribute your success to your dad. That must be must play crazy games on your head. So there are kind of, you know, there are pros and cons to both sides of the argument. But I do like the fact that Tom Hanks is unaware and doesn't really have a grip on reality because he's fucking tom hanks but this nepotism baby discourse is getting a bit boring i'm not going to lie then i went to quickly move on to this this is a quick article courtesy of us weekly or no us magazine um us magazine us Ask, i hate these fucking plays on side and it says the following kylie jen and travis scott split again after spending the holidays apart <laughs> they'll always remain friends isn't it hilarious how the holidays do that to you right have you ever been on a trip with somebody especially a friend mostly and you realize oh rah you have some friends that are good to go holidays with and you have some friends that are good to hang out with you have some friends that are good to go to restaurants with some friends you go oh, God. like you've got some friends that you do certain activities with but holidays are usually i feel like a real test of friendship i can't imagine what it's like to be in a relationship that must be a whole different vibe because i've heard people nowadays again we live in a weird world but i've heard people nowadays legitimately legitimately going on holiday with people that they've met on tinder and stuff like taking people out on t on you know on people that they met on flipping dating apps and taking them on holiday which is to me mind-blowing like why you do that some of you don't know it's crazy but it's already you know because you know how bad it gets when you go with your actual friend that you know and you realize oh shit there's things i didn't know about your personality that i'm now getting to see in hd out here on holiday that's turning me off to be your friend going forward and that could be quite sad and quite heartbreaking to take but you know it happens quite often but why i want to mention this story is that for whatever reason i think the kind of again the genders and connections are really interesting people to look at as a family because of their ability to kind of dictate the narrative out there and to kind of you know push away or dissuade or really you know um have some influence on the fact that some people don't talk about this bit of the conversation enough about their lack or for me again looking from a outside point of view not being a bulls deep fan but what looks at what appears to be their inability to hold down marriages relationships husbands whatever it may be there's a real lack of it within this family for whatever reason they all seem to be you know by you know i'm sure for their own choice single mothers um kind of balancing things and you know kind of being a girl boss sort of vibe but they will have a real inability to really hold down marriages and men in general and it's really funny to see that despite everything that they have despite them each being you know multi-millionaires a couple of them probably being close to billionaire status you know opportunities and brandings and marketing deals coming out of the wazoo endless amounts um privilege and luxury and riches beyond compare but for whatever reason they don't seem to be able to make men decide hey these this you're for me i'm for you forever we're gonna hold it down there it goes out there guys are always looking across the aisle and looking over somebody else and you think if you're with a general you're with a collection really is there anybody else especially if you like that kind of personality you like that person you like living in that sort of world who else would you want to go with apart from that kind of person because they should be the final boss that you want to achieve but for every reason i'm assuming personality wise or maybe just life-wise something happens in between that kind of just turns guys off or that you know as you maybe you'd heard out there there's a kardashian curse where you know you kind of go google Goo mag you know you kind of go Goo Goo maga <laughs> if you're kanye but you just go a bit crazy when you're with them but there is definitely something about that but i also am intrigued of the lack of conversation around it you don't really hear people mention it too often about the string of relationships that they had the string of failed marriages that they've had and it just keeps going on and on and on and it's pretty crazy to see considering that they are all kind of quote-unquote self-made and they have all the money in the world and stuff that no man is willing to kind of put up with it for the longest time which is really really funny oh go away here i don't want to leave me alone can i just oh, is it gonna make oh my gosh can i this is annoying i hate these sites i hate these sites we've got the t unlock for exclusive content i do not want to unlock or oh, is this kind of is this a paywall is that why they're making me do this maybe it's a paywall 
let's see if there's a paywall um i think i maybe unlock it anyway it says over here let me, let me just, pause, let's just pause it there let's see if hopefully it doesn't unlock it and anyway, it says here, yeah, it's over again. So let's go for the This is the article. It says it's over again. Kai and Travis Scott are split. Oh my god, no, leave me alone. Right, cool. It says it's over again. Kai and and Travis Scott are split after rekindling their romance in February 2020. A source exclusively tells Us Weekly. It says Kylie and Travis are off again. They were supposed to spend the holidays together, but she went to Aspen to be with her family and friends up there. This has been, happened so many times before. They're known to be on and off again, but always remain close friends and great camp co parents. News that the duo recorded quits comes after Jenna, 25, took to uh, took her and Scott's four year old daughter, Stormy, on a New Year's Eve getaway to Aspen with her friends, Hayley Bieber and Justin Bieber, and Stace and Stan see whatever her name is um the kind of cosmetic founder shared a clip of herself and her little one sledding on a via tiktok on sunday the first of the video and a california native can be heard saying we're on a serious adventure right now before going to separate ways jenna supported the rapper Faye one during the december 2020 performance in miami lots of 50 cent and wayne and cynthia bosch um gathering at the time the collection star packed on the pda with travis scott before they took the stage then on off again couple welcomed their first child secretly in february 2018 the twosome publicly the twosome what publicly confirmed that the rumors less than a year prior just a few years after jenna and her ex tiger called quits for good after two years together us confirmed that the reality star our sicker mode performer were taking their first official break but would remain friends so they could amicably co-parent i don't know what is it about them that guys don't seem to just hang around again maybe it's just their choice and they decide hey we're done with you once they kind of you know need the babies that they need once they get the clap that they need they just kind of bend the guys but i don't understand i really don't understand what kind of causes guys to go out of their way to kind of pull away from these people and not want to be associated in any way shape or form i wonder what it is i wonder but for whatever reason no one talks about it no one cares we keep blaming the men for all these type of things i guess it is what it is in another instance of me kind of proving this idea that i have we live in this kind of you know i want everything society where people want to be the hero and the villain at the same time um this is another good example of it this is courtesy of cnbc it says prince harry reportedly alleges a new book that brother william physically attacked him in spare william will claim that the, during the 2019 fire at his home in london william called megan difficult rude and abrasive according to a guardian report harry reportedly accused him of repeatedly attacking lines in the british of, of accuse him of repeating attack lines in british press harry describes in a recent Netflix documentary how relationship with his brother currently the prince of Wales, and the first in line has deteriorated um it says here yeah, the uk duh, duh, duh. harry described the recent efforts documentary how relationship with williams um had deteriorated amid negative coverage of his wife megan and um harry or the duke of duchess of west gave up the title of the royal highness and will no longer receive public funds in spare harry will claim that difficult sorry will claim that during a 2019 fight at his home in london william called megan difficult rude and abrasive according to the guardian harry reportedly accused him of repeating attack lines in the british press um harry also alleges that william grabbed him by the collar ripping his necklace and knocked him down on the floor he repeats sorry he writes he then landed on a dog bowl which shattered leaving him with scrapes and bruises which is hilarious because just the other day it felt like there was this article going around from a snippet of the book where he says he alleges he kills 25 taliban right so in one instance he's a bad man who kind of you know shoots at taliban soldiers um from a helicopter i think it was right and hits them with a couple of missiles and takes out 25 but in the other instance he's crying foul that his big brother ripped his neck with necklace off his neck and pushed him into a dog bowl like everybody wants one and the other you know in in one instance he's the victim in another instance he's the bad you know badass um army guy who's killing taliban soldiers it's absolutely egregious in my opinion that people are kind of picking both things to be at the same time but i feel like we live in this sort of society at the moment where everyone just wants to be everything and another really good example of it is this courtesy of gunner's instagram obviously most of you will know what's happening with gunner right now um he obviously unfortunately had to um snitch on ysl on young thug to essentially grant himself the plea deal to essentially grant himself early release so that he wouldn't be rotting away in the prison somewhere and now obviously people are looking at him like he's a snitch after the video came out of him yes ma'am yes ma'am sir madam thing in the court 
sorry and judging by the reaction from some of the people in YSL and people associated with YSL clearly they all feel like he is a snitch in some way shape or form and for whatever reason he doesn't seem to accept it he posted this Instagram um, clip featuring a picture of him sitting down in a very big luxurious looking mansion with great furniture a piece of cool artwork on a wall with a studio installed in there with a you know with a whiteboard looks like he's kind of you know figuring out some music he's putting together and the caption is hilarious it says niggas acting like they switch into a side but it's only one side hashtag ysl is the label so ysl the label hashtag free gunner and yak gunner back with two c's maybe kind of attributing to the idea that he's still a crip when you know you would imagine considering that he snitched i'm assuming those guys are probably not going to claim it either and this goes back to what i said previously people want everything they want to be the hero they want to be the villain so in this in this respect gunner for some reason is is okay with snitching to grant him early release but then he's not okay with being labeled a snitch but then he also wants to be uh, labeled to be a bad man as well in the same way which makes some sense because not everybody that snitches is a pussy right you could still be about it if you snitch we've seen many um, instances of it look at the cartel look at the organized crime families across europe of course some of those guys have snitched but they've still you know serial killers and assassins and murderers in their own right but well, for whatever reason in hip-hop people want everything again in culture in culture at large people want both things they don't accept the fact that sometimes if you do one thing it can unfortunately define you that if it comes out that you're a creep unfortunately until the end of time you're going to be the creep if it comes out you raped unfortunately to the end of time you're going to be the rapist no matter what you did prior those labels are going to stick more than all the stuff you did beforehand that was good handing out turkeys giving people free bikes and stuff it just is what it is it's the nature of the game that's why whenever you make decisions or in your decision making process you should maybe think long and hard about everything that you do and i'm kind of i'm starting to realize this now the soon the older that i get the more that i'm starting to realize that i don't get a chance at a first impression anymore so I don't get a second chance at first impression anymore. Sometimes the first instance of somebody learning about me or hearing my voice or hearing what I have to say is the first and only time. So you have to make sure you present yourself in the most, um, um, in the most authentic, real, and kind of legit way as possible, so that whatever version of the view they're seeing, it is a real kind of quote unquote version of you, not some weird other side version that you're trying to you know trigger people with, or you're playing a character for that particular moment, or if something just said out of emotion. You have to always sort of mar you know meditate and think on everything that you do because you never know the repercussions of that one instance and how far it can get you. You know, this is the kind of clear example of it. You know, um, that whole dilly dance and kind of flirtation with gang culture and you know gang insignia and shit it took gunner's career uh, to a certain level i still think the music was probably the main reason why people kind of you know um gravitate to him i know i did for the most part the music the melodies um you know some of the bars some of the you know some of the beat selection top tier and you know i really really loved it in that regard and i'm still going to listen to it going forward but you can't deny that some of the gang affiliations and the fact that he flirted with danger in some regard is definitely going to add a little bit of spice to you but for whatever reason these guys feel as if when they snitch they still have to maintain that level of spice and they have to fight for it and kind of fight back against the label of snitch when really if you did tell and you cooperate with the you know with the police or you offered evidence in any kind of way then you were a snitch there's no way around it, it is what it is it's not like the you know regular civilians like myself can't come out here and kind of you know chastise you for it but the label is the label because you did what you did it just is what it is but for whatever reason they don't accept it. it is what it is i'm more curious to see how his career progresses going forward i feel like you know we do live in a pick and choose selective politic in society and world so for sure the treatment that he's going to get is going to be nowhere near to what six nine got mostly mostly because six nine is you know phenomenally un unlikable and he also went out of his way his entire career prior to snitching to goading antagonizing people online and acting like a villain acting like he was about really with it and when it came down to kind of showing he was really with it he clearly folded and kind of you know put many people in prison you know then went out of his way to mention people like jim jones and cardi b and stuff like just egregious things so you can run time people kind of not liking him for the for the most part and he was kind of like a wrestling heel villain type of vibe so he was never going to be liked in that way 
So I'm sure Gunn is not going to get the same reaction, but I'm curious to see how it happens with the other peers, the peers that don't like to get involved in the politicking and the outward, you know, distancing of certain people. What do they do? How do they kind of stand next to somebody like this if they are the ones preaching, you know, to snitching or this sort of vibe? I'm not really too sure how it progresses. And I'm curious also to hear his opinion on things because I'm honestly curious to see if he would legitimately stand on the fact that he thinks he's not a snitch. And why does he think that? If we got footage of him in the court, you know, cooperating, um, you know, and basically uh, putting YSL under the hammer, and essentially kind of writing, you know, basically, you know, ending ending Young Fag and all those guys' career because he's the one that kind of confirmed, yes, this label is a label and it's also a criminal organization. I'm curious to see how he can excuse saying those things in court and also say, how that doesn't make him a snitch it just doesn't make any sense but for the music i'm here for it um as always unfortunately with great pain and with great struggle he's for sure is gonna make banger music going forward now probably his best he's ever made because he's having to fight back against so much and he's kind of been counted out but just looking at it from the outside perspective also this picture you can clearly understand why somebody like this could get would likely snitch in the same way people were saying about six nine like they should have you know that there's this common um thing going around with some people who are involved in that kind of world who say they should have known he was never about anything and they should have never brought him around because i think six nine was around every time the nine tray bloods were talking about you know illegal activities and whatnot and he was privy to some information that he probably shouldn't have been privy to because he was never really about that life so some people are putting the blame on the gang more so than six nine saying hey don't bring a square around you because if it comes down to you know you facing some time behind bar he's going to be the first one to snitch so with that being said we should have probably known looking at Gunner's lifestyle i've seen this really cool clip of Gunner. i think he's driving like a lamborghini or something um by himself in a lamborghini puffing on a flipping um on a joint and he's just speeding he just stops and he just like so the tune plays it drops and he speeds off and the car's got like those white rims that kind of i don't know how they do it but it's a white rim that kind of moves independent of the wheel so when the wheel's going forward the rim is kind of spinning backwards and stuff like crazy right it looks amazing the car i think is like an iridescent blue or something um I, obviously i've mentioned two clips of him going to italy to support the brand emiliano pucci when he was doing the whole pushing p thing and you're surrounded by all these glitzy shiny looking italian people and you know runway models and stuff and just living in a lap of luxury then you look at this picture of his home i'm assuming this is his home i'd assume i don't think it's a studio i think this is actually his home that he's turned into a makeshift studio and it is fucking beautiful high ceilings massive windows and um, you know a core cool piece of artwork and a lot on the left that could be any core contemporary artwork person that probably shows in some guggenheim gallery somewhere a couple of boards showing some ideas of stuff he's working on a nice little home studio set up with some care case speakers like you could have seen this picture and instantly known that this person would definitely snitch because of the picture look at it this is luxury how do you think that person was going to be able to handle sitting inside a pen and chilling and also the first couple of videos you saw of them two together in court and how sheepish she was looking at gun at young thug you could tell he maybe snitched already you know he wasn't really making too much eye contact young thug was the one kind of you know saying what's up how are you you know sharing a bit of jokes lol but he wasn't trying to look up he wasn't trying to really uh, conversate too much because he already knew what he said you know behind closed doors so clearly that was already on the cards but looking at his picture already you can tell you can tell this person was definitely not going to um sacrifice their freedom um you know to give up all of this kind of luxury that they're living unfortunately which is again unfortunate in my opinion because i feel like if you do dedicate yourself to a life of crime you should be willing and accepting all the concepts that come with it because you're accepting the pros the pros that come with it is the fact that you're going to be rich beyond your wildest belief right you're definitely rich beyond in a very short period of time you can make a lot of money but there's also the added added sort of um threat of you essentially having to um know that in the back of your mind at any point you could get killed or you could end up in prison those are the things that you kind of have to weigh up in your head and to sit there and just always have the eject button and the press if you feel uncomfortable press if you want to go home and see your kids and you snitch on people who you you know willingly agree to partake in this sort of nonsense with is really egregious i don't like it in the slightest i think you should always commit it's like i have the same thing when it comes to religion i've got people who kind of you know have one foot in one foot out of religion 
or they're like Christians and you know they whatever and they're covered in tattoos or they believe in sex before marriage it's like no 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 if you want to be an actual Christian like commit to all of it in full like live that life and if you don't live that life cool but let's not have that whole in and out one foot in one foot out for sort of vibe it's not, I'm not with it in the slightest never have never will be and Ghana kind of did the same thing there but again as a fan of the music I'm still going to listen to it then we have to move on to this business insider India article featuring Adidas and Kanye West and I'm thinking myself considering what we know now about cancel culture and that it's over and that it's a bit lame and it doesn't really do anything and it's a bit self-serving it's a bit performative and it kind of only really speaks to or addresses the noise and the unrest coming from a very small minority of people online I'm thinking to myself you know regardless of what Kanye has done post in this and kind of going on Alex Jones and the whole crazy Hitler double downing and triple downing and uh, Nick Fuentes stuff and whatnot I still think for me personally cancelling somebody like a Kanye this sort of deal with Adidas knowing what them what money and what clout what attention what marketing um, what branding and what valid validity authenticity he brings to your brand is really short-sighted in my opinion it's beyond short-sighted and I feel like there should be some executive at head office, um, Adidas, who are looking at it thinking, we probably jumped the gun. We probably should have waited and let it chill out a bit. Because you see what's happening with Balenciaga, right? You see how they've kind of gone a bit quiet. They've not really said much about Demna. There's rumours that he might get fired or if he's going to walk or whatever. But so far, they've kind of weathered the storm and it's worked out pretty well for them. And they're going to pop out soon with another collection during Paris Fashion Week coming up in a couple of weeks. And then it's kind of going to be a bit over. We're going to see it. So this is courtesy of Vince inside of India. This is Adidas is stuck with Yeezy sneakers worth more than 500 million after parting ways with Kanye West, a report says. And it says here, um, Adidas is stuck with Yeezy sneakers worth up to 500 million. Um, the German sportswear giant is now trying to sell the items under its own brand to minimize potential losses, according to a report. Yeezy accounted for about 7% of Adidas' sales this year to the value of 1.7 billion euros, the newspaper said. Surely at some point, if you're a real hard-nosed businessman who's all about the X's and O's, crossing the you know, crossing your T's, dotting your I's, surely you have to look at things like this without the um you know, uh, without the emotional, in the moment fluttering of noise on social media and make business decisions. Because if you're you know, cut enough to nose to spite your face for 1.7 billion to do the quote unquote right thing, and then all these shoes are going to be defunct and gone, and you're going to ruin the value of them, and the association with them is going to be gone and cheaper. And especially if Kanye comes out and says, Don't buy the shoes, which he didn't, but if he does say that, you're essentially left with an absolute hole in your pocket. And clearly, in those business environments, if you cost them too much money, you end up the one on a chopping block. You'll end up losing your job. So not only do you lose the Kanye deal because you want to appease people online and kind of appear to be woke, but then you also lose your own job. And those people don't like losing their jobs because they probably got seven kids in boarding school somewhere in the middle of the Austrian Alps that costs like a 10 grand a day. So clearly they need to keep that budget going. So it's a bit crazy to think that. Going forward, Adidas UT partnership came to an abrupt halt in October after the rapper made an anti-Semitic remarks on Twitter. Adidas said it would take a 247 million hit to its profits as a result. This must be the most expensive um, cancel culture thing I've ever seen in my entire life. I think we've seen people individually say, hey, I've lost millions off of brand deals because I got cancelled. But for a brand themselves to take that blow is unprecedented because you could have been excused if they said hey you know what he said what he said and with us being a german company and with, with germany still trying their best to apologize and to make right with what happened you know we're flipping hitler in the first place with the jews and whatnot it makes sense why they have to make some kind of start especially considering their history with with the nazi uh, with nazis themselves but surely they would have been a more wiser decision to be like hey we're going to see out this contract and we're not going to renew it or we're going to get rid of whatever's in the pipeline for the next couple of quarters and then we're going to end it but to end it so abruptly it kind of probably speaks to how unlikable Kanye was as a person also think about that because that's an element people don't really mention too often as much as it cost them to hit the hit in the 250 million they probably went to make that cut just because they didn't like to work with the guy like they were willing to lose out financially to lose out on their own personal bonuses, which is a selfish thing, but most of those business guys at that level are intrinsically selfish, but they also just didn't want to do business with a guy. Like he annoyed them so much 
They were willing to cut their nose off to spite their face. And they were willing to get rid of him just to kind of get rid of him for the sake of it. Hey, we're going to get 257 million loss. It's going to affect our bonuses. We're not going to be able to buy our wives a Lamborghini or a Birkin, but it means we will not have to kind of respond to this guy's ranting or have us have him show us porn on his phone in meetings and stuff like crazy. Several other companies dropped easy products from their stores, resulting in West comments, including Balenciaga, Gap, and Foot Locker. Last month, Adidas announced it was investigating West, also known as um, Ye, following a Rosa report that he had acted inappropriately around Yeezy stuff. <laughs> yeah, that report was wild. I think I read it, or I think I shared it on my uh, Patreon, so definitely check it out if you haven't already. But essentially, it's him just being, you know, Kanye in a workplace environment. I kind of had a bit of an iffy vibe about it because I felt like, you know, for the most part, I've kind of occupied the stance that a lot of people in the industry enabled Kanye to be the way he is for the longest time because he's an absolute genius in music and somewhat of a genius in fashion and product and activations and stuff. People just excused it and his star power is so bright that people were willing to stand next to him in spite of all the other nonsense stuff that he'd done. But obviously he kept ramping it up because it's just Kanye. He's going to keep ramping it up and now it's got to a point where people can't stand behind it anymore and now everyone's trying to speak and say their piece about what happened. But before when Yeezys were selling like hotcakes and people were sharing all their gifting pairs that they were getting, no one said a word. But now it's kind of trendy not to be a fan of his and to kind of push away from it. Everyone now has got a voice and they want to stand up for something. So it's a little bit like, get out of here. It can, continues. That's, that's my point. Um, it claimed that West um, showed workers explicit materials of his ex-wife in a meeting based on interviews with more than two dozen former Yeezy staff and employees. Again, don't care, not my business. The Rolling Stone report recruited many came by a former uh, Yeezy worker that witnessed Ye tell a young woman of colour to sit on the floor during an hours-long meeting. He allegedly told the designer she didn't deserve to sit on the table. Well, that's your problem, isn't it? Letting somebody like Kanye talk to you that way just because they're Kanye West is legitimately more of a you problem than a him problem because you wouldn't let anybody else talk to you like that. You're only letting him talk to you like that because he's who he is. Standing up for yourself and having, you know, some dignity, having some pride and, you know, drawing a line in the sand and saying this is unacceptable in any way, shape or form or standing up to the person in that moment should go a long way. But people don't. People are so desperate and willing to do anything to get opportunities in this industry that they would legitimately sacrifice their own personal dignity and self-worth to have it. And now they want to cry and, cry, you know, complain and cry foul. You can miss me with that. But yeah, um, I just being hit with that bill and having to kind of weather that storm, I feel like is what they deserve for making a hasty decision i feel like in the long and short of it this will probably look but they'll look back on a, this will definitely look back they'll look back on this and see this is a huge l for sure they should have maybe been a bit more patient and chilled out even though what he was saying was absolutely nuts i still think in the grand scheme of things getting into business with someone like a Kanye West you kind of have to expect the unexpected you kind of have to have contingency plans in your partnership deal where you think hey if he comes out and says some wild thing or he gets caught with some wild thing this is what we're going to do x y x y and z like you can't be going into things thinking he's a reformed character he's not going to step out of line he's not going to say something crazy he's not going to be unmanageable he's not going to be pr friendly this is what Kanye has been through his entire career. And now the thing with him, which is probably the worst kind of combination for Kanye, if you are a brand trying to work with him, is that he's been shown over time that he doesn't really face that many harsh consequences. Life still goes on for him. It's all well and good. And secondly, he's a billionaire. Oh, he was a billionaire. Now he's a multi-millionaire, but still he's got a lot of money. And I feel like now in a position where he's got the money, money kind of has always kind of been for him like a, a validation thing right of like hey this is proof my ideas work this is also proof that i know what i'm doing this is also proof that people like what i do so if you come out here and say something contrary to what i feel or what i think what who am i to i'm not gonna listen to you because number one you don't have much money as me and also the money that i've accrued is from millions of people out there saying that they like what i do so the money and the fortune and the fame has got him to a level where he can't listen to anybody he already said himself right if you're broken then you can't talk to him you can't give him advice and that's not him being funny that's him being legit so if you're a corporation you come to business with him and you try and you know give him a telling off or try and give him some insights that he maybe would glean off of in a meeting, he's going to definitely throw a spanner in the work or maybe throw a spanner at you. So crazy to see this happening to, to, to Yeezy. I think they deserve it for being too hasty. I mean, I either, sorry, they deserve it for being too hasty. And 
more than likely the shoes that they have to sell anyway will probably end up selling out because they're Yeezys and it's the last ones left but this is kind of a good lesson to be learned in maybe not reacting so quickly to social media outrage and maybe having a plan to distance yourself with somebody that's controversial in a kind of um in a stagnated in, in well, it kind of in a delayed process right it's delayed or stagnation i don't know basically in a step-by-step -step process not just going straight out and cutting it off but you know maybe that's also a sign that Kanye was so unlikable that people went to get as far away from him as possible as far away from him as possible and they've already done it clearly and you know we kind of are where we are when it comes to that sort of stuff then I'm going to move on and see and talk about this which I think is far rather, rather rather interesting regarding people that are getting cancelled when it comes to designer stuff and it regarding Balenciaga because I think the fashion shows are coming up right in a couple of weeks or a few weeks Paris Fashion Week is going to pop off soon so we're going to see Balenciaga on the runway we'd assume so and we're probably going to see Demna at the end of that runway still you know at the helm of Balenciaga for sure and it's interesting because it feels like there's definitely been a less noise around everything around Balenciaga when it comes to the whole like you know BDSM teddy bears and stuff no one's really been talking about it too tough it kind of went away and um, Balenciaga maybe dealt with it pretty well all things considering how rampant it was because remember this wasn't an issue that they had to face you know from fashion twitter or from the fashion community which is kind of noisy but they don't really affect things on a global scale but this came into politics this was involved with you know for whatever reason the right wingers out there latched onto the whole Balenciaga bdsm thing and turned it whole to into a conspiracy um epstein's island um you know human trafficking um loads of nonsense stuff kind of got attributed to it that's why it made it go completely global to the point where people were out there um attacking my girl what's her name um, the stylist who used to work with Vetamon back in the day and now works with Mew Mew and does sort of Mark Jacob stuff but they were even attacking her and she's kind of out of the way really kind of you know somebody that you'd only know about if you're really plugged into fashion and care about stuff like styling and who contributes to certain things like you wouldn't know about her at all I think no, sorry, that's her name Lotta Volkova right they even attacked Lotta Volkova who's somebody that I've been following for many 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 years and it was kind of crazy to see her on like you know CNN and stuff you know having to defend herself and say nah this kind of edgy weird stuff I post on my Instagram it just edgy weird shit i'm not actually into kiddie diddling or anything along those kind of lines so it's a bit crazy to see but it's also been interesting to see Balenciaga's refusal or caring's refusal to kind of come out and comment on the rumors going around that allegedly Balenciaga were kind of distanced off from, from demna and we're going to try and do their own thing and i think the rumors that initially first came out was that the Balenciaga account um had unfollowed demna but when I checked recently, they don't follow anybody. And Demna's official account doesn't follow anybody either. So I'm not sure if that's legitimately true. But that was the initial story that was coming out there that, hey, um, Balenciaga, no, not official story. That was the rumor going around there that Balenciaga had um, followed Demna on the platform um, on Instagram. And then, of course, there's stories like this on the screen. This is courtesy of Footwear News, where they say Balenciaga's scandal seemed to contribute into a bad as it gets Q4 for caring, which I feel like is a little bit of... Um, convenient argument and article to put out there if you're anti those um bears but i don't think it really is rooted in any sort of facts of the situation if anything it feels that like to me maybe similar to what's happening with gucci when they were under alessandro what's his name Michele, there was clearly the sales clearly showed or the dip in sales clearly showed that maybe the customer base was getting a bit bored of that kind of kitschy vibe that he was kind of presenting at gucci and i felt like over certain seasons even myself being an avid fan of them and what he does at balenciaga it's fair to say that it's been a bit boring it's not been the same as it was beforehand it's kind of getting a little bit tired and it's kind of getting a bit repetitive and obviously the dip in sales or the declining sales maybe illustrates that maybe there is also an added you know element of what's going on in this in in the world overall in terms of the financial collapse and this kind of weird recession that we're in at the moment at the, you know given everything that's going on post pandemic that all those things will contribute to the dip in sales but i don't think it was specific because of the bears because I, I think generally regular schmegular people don't really care because you know you see already what's happening with the steroid boots they sold out you see what happened with the kaggle bags they were a hot ticket and and loads of other things that kind of came and went from Balenciaga that really kind of popped off in terms of retail and sales point of view that clearly people still give a crap about the brand so that's not really the shame and obviously the fact that I've always thought weirdly enough that Balenciaga doesn't get enough credit for being one of the best 
plus size luxury brands out there without being plus size because everything they make is square and boxy it kind of complements and flatters everybody for the most part unless you want to wear the kind of spandex tight stuff that they make but for the most part if you want to wear square boxy big oversized type of clothing luxury from a luxury brand blends yoga does the best so it's able to appeal to a lot more people than maybe your average brand like a celine or like a um, saint laurent or whatever maybe because they kind of specifically cut for a particular type of shape mostly european mostly slim mostly slender but anyway let's read this report regardless it says um balenciaga's ad scandal stifled the brand's hyper growth mode notably in the us and the uk meaning the fourth quarter results for the french luxury group caring could be as bad as it gets according to an equity uh, sorry an equity research report from hsbc released on thursday the bank also cited slow momentum in china and the us and a tough basis of comparison as additional factors likely to have dented caring's revenues um during the crucial holiday season it forecasts q4 revenues due to out on the february 15th will slip by three point one percent in organic terms reflecting a 12.5 dip at gucci and an eight percent improvement in other brands including balenciaga as mcqueen uh bocciano Brioni, Pom- pomaletto and quillin still the report titled leave your troubles behind suggested that the worst at balenciaga is likely behind us and that gucci is likely to do better in 2023 despite the exit of a creative director alessandro michelli who helped take the italian brand from 3.9 billion euros in 2015 to 9.7 billion euros in 2019 i'm sorry but if i took you from 3.9 to 9.7 and you push me out of the brand without giving me a final show send-off i'm gonna be pissed off like fashion is fucking unfair and it awful Asano McKelly legitimately made them okay Gucci was already Gucci don't get me wrong but in terms of capturing a zeitgeist in terms of creating a community in terms of creating a language a taste an aesthetic a texture a vibe he did a real he did a lot in a very short space of time and to get that boot and to not have the opportunity to kind of go down the runway one more time and cry and get his flowers figuratively um plus metaphorically is really a big shame especially when you consider the flipping money the bottom line that he kind of contributed to flipping caring is absolutely horrible but hey we continue um his successor yet to be named it continues it appears that the management is starting to address the issues faced by gucci brand the commitment to spend more in terms of advertising combined with a stronger team in the mainland china as well as merchandising should help the brand converge towards peers sales growth and regardless of the fact that it will be in a transition period beyond saga represents about 10 percent of caring's two fund 2021 group sell which is a lot versus 55 percent of gucci and 40 percent of saint laurent and eight percent of a particular Vanessa, according to hsbc charts tableting the company data i wonder if that's the reason why they're thinking hey let's make a change to blenciaga so we can kind of up that amount or maybe gucci's thinking that they're thinking they should be um or maybe Gucci think they should be higher than 55%, which is still quite a lot if you think about it. Um, HBC also cut its earnings uh, before interest tax estimates for caring by an average of 4%, uh, blah, blah, blah. Among the downsides, risk of COVID leading to delays in tourism, late spending, and longer term pain of Balenciaga from the recent PR problems, which I, I don't know, man. I just don't buy that. I don't think people care like that because counterculture shows us people don't care because if you're a fan of somebody because that's the thing people don't realize with counterculture especially when it comes to mainstream people it's not that they're getting counseled it's more so that the platforms are not platform them so if you get counseled and you're a big hollywood star you most likely are not going to get invited to the Hol- to golden globes you're not going to get a major network deal somewhere you're not going to have a special you're not going to have a program out on netflix so all the normie easy to access places people can check out your stuff they can't check it out anymore that's why those careers kind of come to a in end but if they were still available to be showcased on these platforms they'll still be popular do you know what i mean it would still be popular i'm sure if roseanne was still available on tv and didn't cancel after what she said it would have still kind of popped off so with this sort of stuff with the pr you know stuff that brands do the fact that Ben Shark is still being sold, the brand hasn't been quote unquote cancelled. They're not they haven't just they haven't closed down the stores. Them there's not D E A A D whatever it may be, right? Like I don't believe this whole idea that that one teddy bear thing kind of contributed to their dip. I think there's other contributing factors that kind of line up conveniently with what happened with the bears. People are making kind of easy conclusions, but I think it's way, way bigger than that, in my opinion. Um and I feel like overall we will see what the deal is going forward in Paris fashion week coming up. We'll see what the actual vibe is like coming up. But I'm curious to see, because I think going forward, 
what they may end up doing is they may end up using as opportunity to pivot the brand overall and just change everything about it and kind of maybe um return it to its roots to some regard and you're kind of seeing it already with the instagram this again is a throwaway observation for me because i'm not that plugged in i don't really know what's actually going on but judging by what they've uploaded on the instagram during the holidays and everything and they kind of stripped everything away they removed comments which is kind of weird so people can't really give feedback on the public platform and whatnot but it does feel like this little piece they put together best wishes and happy new year i'm doing that whole controversy i feel like was a definitely a sign as to what they're going to try to go back to because for the longest time you know as much as i love them now he was basically running a mock at them balenciaga doing exactly what he wanted essentially kind of taking the same provocation and sort of uh nuisance levels that he was running with when he was at Vetemar and kind of in, you know in, in, imbuing it in fashion maybe a lot of it as well I always think and wonder that kind of provocation and wanting to always you know uh, tease people in fashion I wonder if that's kind of um, founded in some level of pettiness some level of bitterness as well maybe of what he's kind of gone through as a designer himself kind of struggling and kind of coming up the ranks and working in different houses and the kind of ugly side of fashion that he's seen maybe this is him kind of taking it out on people through his designs by currently making the fashion industry the kind of butt of the jokes even though they don't realize it in their kind of collections i don't know maybe it's the case but regardless there was probably a little bit too much of it and it probably tried to turn off people within fashion to the point where they were starting to kind of you know you know doubt or question his design skills when really i still think this guy's really at the top level but he just chooses to make you know fashion or he chooses to make clothes that most fashion people don't necessarily gravitate towards in terms of like streetwear kind of you know average everyday wearing type of stuff people want to see this type of showmanship they want to see this type of archival couture really challenging social norms kind of stuff and really pushing the envelope things are a little bit more avant-garde and maybe he kind of purposely steers away from that and tries to elevate the mundane to luxurious levels and people don't necessarily like that but i feel like this clip that's on the blend sugar instagram account now at the moment which says best wishes for the new year archival christopher balenciaga footage compilation from 1960 to 1967 right which is kind of, again this is kind of the era that most fashion people love about balenciaga they kind of you know fall over head and heels anything to involve in christopher's era of back then this might be a sign that they may use the opportunity this cancellation to go back to the drawing board and kind of rein them in and say hey you're our guy you've kind of made blinch yoga relevant again you've restored the feeling you've kind of provided loads of interesting cultural moments the stores have become a destination to go to people want to show off the bags the, the sales are going through the roof but all these theatrics all these games all these kind of flirtations with the devil on the outside and the kitty diddling it must come to an end we must resort and go back to what we are as a house what we are as a brand what we represent in fashion and the people we're trying to represent and kind of uphold and this vision blah 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 so maybe this is a sign of it going forward and we're going to see more of it um going forward with Blanchard because even as I, as I said myself as a avid fan of the brand i feel like it's definitely kind of fell by the way Side in recent years and it's not really been hitting the same in the slightest in the slightest so maybe we'll see this change popping up going forward and maybe we'll see them to be reined in maybe someone will definitely put them under control let's see let's bloody see moving on a quick way to touch upon this i thought this is absolutely incredible incredible news courtesy of coachella they revealed their lineup for this year and it feels like this year is going to be the year of festivals for real last year i felt like people just put on the festivals to kind of get out of the pandemic and sort of be like hey we're out of the pandemic we're living free now everything's back to normal but it really wasn't back to normal but this time this time what i've seen so far this time it feels like we're actually back to normal because this lineup is legitimately maybe one of the most insane ones next to the flipping what should we call it um next to um primavera this is definitely up there so this is coachella 2023 lineup and they've announced it officially now zooming in you see on the friday headlining bad bunny on the saturday black pink and on the sunday frank bloody ocean yes frank ocean makes his return to the stage at coachella 
in April. Is it April as usual? Is it April? Yes, it's in April. Absolutely maddening. It's always just two consecutive weekends. So if you miss the first one, you get the second one. But the lineup is absolutely wild. Bad Bunny on the opening weekend for Coachella, considering what we've seen of his live show so far, considering how incredible his live performances have been. This is whole entire time he's been on tour, doing arenas and stadiums, locking down streets, throwing people's phones into the swimming pool. It's going to be nuts. I can't wait to see it. So it says Bad Bunny headlining. You got Gorillas as well there. Um, who Gorillas kind of felt like they're like um, Gorillas are like a worldwide version of Hot Chip in the UK. For whatever reason, the Hot Chip guys keep getting gigs off of the fact that they had like one decent album way back when, right? The Alexis Taylor guy keeps getting DJ gigs. Other people in the band keep getting like they keep getting prominent positions, you know, in lineups because of what they did back then with hot chip it feels like gorillas are the same thing for the world they just keep getting all this kind of love for again one decent album back way back when and nothing else since then but hey regardless the hot chip gorillas burner boy god damn it chemical brothers k Trinada, blondie becky g um metro booming which would be sick to see him perform actually i wonder if they would just be like him djing his tracks or it'd be him actually inviting people on stage to perform the tracks that he's done with them maybe some things that he hasn't performed yet he's gonna be sick regardless fkj pusha g toby and gooey wet leg sg lewis Yves tumor who i'm awesome who i'm really looking forward to seeing at primavera when i go you got test pilot angel mona messioplex wow why messioplex is so far messioplex must be doing a lot i haven't i haven't heard these men mentioned in a while as a dj the fact that he's listed so high up must mean he's actually doing bits in the u.s that's been a really cool pivot to watch from the outside looking in he went from beefing with nina kravitz being annoyed that he wasn't a hot russian lady right and he wasn't getting the same amount of love as her so now suddenly like playing at flipping premium uh, sorry uh, coachella wow isn't it two friends young blood sick jamie jones is playing sick um and she, ashniko mala tv girl white gang doshi benny idris elba is playing the opening weekend at coachella we're uh magdalene bay vintage culture domi jd who's that person dombriski danny lux mona what's that say nora and pure i don't know who they are um over over mono playing uncle wafles uh loads of people here playing ah, i can't see other names pausa oh shit pausa's playing shit then there's cruise and saba mad mad business techno people are playing at coachella or tech house people that's pretty cool to see to be honest because we're still in the same community even though you know people don't like them i still feel in the same community then on saturday you got blackpink rosalia and blackpink Whoa, it's a double duo that's gonna be fun eric prize hollow boy genius suicide boys great to see them so far up on the lineup the kid Leroy, miss me charlie xcx is gonna smash coachella to pieces i don't care she's got bangers upon bangers upon bangers labyrinth you can miss me with that one underworld cool Dilgit Doshan, don't know who that is. Eldado Carido, Saw Tuxa, Remy Wolf. <laughs> Jimmy Wilson, see where I have Chromio. Nice. Tale of Us. Shh, look how many people are. Business Techno is really businessing, isn't it? Masioplex, Tale of Us, Pausa. I'm surprised what's his name is not there. What's his name? Uh, Michael Bibby. I'm surprised he's not playing. Um, Tell of us, Young Lean, Muramasa, Yeji. Oh yeah, Yeji's playing as well. I think she's got an album actually coming out. So big up her. That's going to be. That's going to be fucking fun. She's definitely one of my favorite South Korean DJs out there. That isn't Peggy Goo. She's going to be sick. So I think she's got an album coming out as well. Zero Seven Shake, Mark Rebl Mark Rebl's playing at Coachella. Wow, big up to him. Um, Hiatus Coyote, Dinner Party, Los Fabulous, Cardi um, Cardiliacs uh kenny beats flow millie big up flow millie one of my favorite oh look you got also kind of music raw ted brother Co business techno has taken over kind of music playing flipping coachella that is mad um snail males playing big up her uh hot since 82 yo tech house is the vibe in it atmospheric house tech house white people playing i'm a piano it's gonna be lit <laughs> <laughs> Earth Gang Umi shoot um Shanice that's gonna be awesome to watch her play live. Um Bakar is playing Snooze Fest. No but <laughs> uh, Bakar man absolute uh, anyway let, let's say the battle list. Let's say about DJ Tennis. Look, see my business techno people playing here. 
Um, let's continue on here. Then on the Sunday, of course, you got my man Frank Ocean, Bjork, Kali Uches, Porter Robinson, Fisher, Chris Lake, A Boogie, Dominic Fike. Wow, Jay Paul. Where the hell they pulled that one out? They're gonna have Jay Paul and Frank Ocean playing in the same festival. Are they? Are they legit? Do they think they're gonna turn up? What Jackson Wang, Lotto, Blaze, um, Willow, Glorilla. That's a big one. Big up her. That's a really good thing. Boris Bircher, that guy. That that's fucking Elon Musk's favorite DJ, isn't it? Too many DJs. Shit. Christine and the Queens. So many DJs playing, isn't it? Business techno has gone off, isn't it? Camel Fat. I see there. Who else I see here? I see Pierre Bourne playing. That's going to be pretty nice. Yo, this is going to be fun. And the good thing is that they stream some of the sets. So this might be one of the best ones to stream if you're not going to be able to go there. But this is a really fun lineup. And it's going to be featuring the return to the desert of Calvin Harris is also going to be performing. Oh, this is going to sell out like hotcakes. This is going to be definitely really, really popular, really popping off. So eager to see this going. I do like also the replies where this new trend of the artists who are performing on the stage, writing in the comments. I'm sure it's part of their obligation to kind of reply. You've got Gorillas here, Jackson Wang, Kei Chanada, um, Pierre Bourne, Mark Riblay. Don't you don't even think of for a second of a missing my set. Ashaniko, two friends. Look, all people are replying. I think it's part of your deal when you get booked. You have to kind of reply here. Maybe you don't see it's Frank Ocean and Jay Paul. Power said then his crew is sick, isn't it? That's pretty awesome. I'm pretty I'm pretty um hyped on that to be a fair. That looks really, really fun. So big up all of those guys performing at Coachella. When's it happening? Um April, was it April 14th to the 16th, one weekend, and the other one is 21st or 23rd. You know where to see all that sort of stuff. Google it, you'll find it out if you want to be able to go there. But the big news, of course, is Jay Paul, right? the flipping asian legend right guy here from the uk who is mysterious and you know avant-garde and a bit weird and hasn't been seen for a while and dropped a flipping amazing tape out of nowhere and just kind of ducked and hasn't been seen i think from what i've been hearing on the grapevine he does do some work behind the scenes like songwriting stuff under a pseudonym and stuff but instead of that he just kind of avoids the limelight in any kind of shape or way form even though he's incredibly talented which is annoying but also goes to speak to his actual level of talent and not wanting to be some social media freak out there but his coach your pitchfork says jay paul to perform his first live show ever at coachella 2023 that's an absolute crazy place to debut what you sound like and showcase what you're doing or what you've been up to for all these years at flipping coachella mad in it but big up him and i'm eager to see how he does it to be fair um, and i'm gonna be rooting for him because i'm a big fan of his music so jay paul is set to take stage at coachella this year making his cinematic musical first ever live performance he takes the stage on Sunday, April 16th, and then again on April 23rd. Other musicians on the bill seem to be pretty excited with connection and others tweeting, forget about me performing, I'm going to see Jay Paul. In 2019, the musician issued um, Leak What 0413, Bait Ones, an official version of his unfinished debut album that leaked in 2013, along with two previously unreleased songs. He since marked the 10th anniversary of his track BTSTU with remixes and archival material and made rare cameo on Atlanta earlier this year. This continued to work with his brother, AK Paul, on the Paul Institute operation, which issued a six song EP titled Summer 2020 in a titular year. So yeah, he's definitely been off the grid, definitely been doing his own thing, but I'm curious to see what he does do in, a, in terms of a live performance. Is it going to be him on stage with the lights on live? Is it going to be him, you know, early days of weekend when he wouldn't like to perform with a light on him and we'll kind of sing in the darkness? Is it going to be him as a hologram? Is it going to be him off site streaming a show from a studio somewhere? Is it going to be him doing a DJ set, live performance, dancing TikTok style on stage, inviting people? to do his tracks for him who knows i'm curious to see how it develops when it goes forward but that is crazy and it's going to be super fun to see when he does end up performing and of course we have to mention the fact that bad bunny and frank ocean are on the same flipping lineup at coachella that's absolutely incredible i think bad bunny in terms of rep reputation in terms of a live performer we're going to be definitely seeing something fun from him because these live performances in arenas have been crazy to witness or you know just online um to see the reaction that he's been getting from parts of latin american stuff is going to be crazy to see that same thing happening in the in the u.s and considering the amount of spanish-speaking people that live over there is going to be wild also but the key, of course, has to be Frank Ocean. And just courtesy of Flipping Pitchfork. And I'm not going to be duped by this again. I legitimately went to Primavera Festival the first year that we went. I think it might be 2019. Maybe it's 2018. So I forgot what year it was. 
but it was a year that he basically was marking his return to performing live again outside of what he did for his performances for Blonde. And I went to go Primavera to see him perform that, you know, album or whatnot, another kind of album cuts I'm a big fan of from obviously Channel Orange and Nostalgia Ultra and blah, blah, blah. And the guy, if I'm not mistaken, cancelled the week before we left. And I think since then he did loads of other gigs that he scheduled and then cancelled didn't do. And then from there I was like, you know what, never again. And I should have known better because I don't think I've ever gone to a festival primarily going to see one person except for the one time i went to love box one year to go see dj harvey play which is crazy i paid like 60 pounds um from a person you know who's reselling a ticket on like facebook or something just to go see dj harvey play one set and i think it was like on the imagine if love box festival was on like a friday and a saturday it might be on a saturday and it might be like at 4 p.m so it's like a couple of hours before it ended and i paid 60 quid to see dj harvey play that's the only time i've done it usually when you go to festivals you're going to see many different people in Atlanta because it's all point of a festival right you want to get to you want to get as much out of your money as possible it's kind of it's, it's value for money you pay 200 pounds and you get to see you know bad bunny rosalia frank ocean and stuff and if you look if you break it down a ticket for each of those guys is going to cost you about 100 quid anyway so you're already up then plus all the other people you may see that you may not be familiar with and you know other local acts djs and stuff it kind of adds to the whole ambiance of it so it definitely is um good value for money but again lesson learned for me never go to a festival thinking you're going to see one person in mind that's really foolhardy and dumb of me and i definitely did pay the big price for that but since then I haven't been sold on the fact that Frank Ocean is going to perform anywhere until he actually performs. And as a fan of him, it is a bit annoying. I know he's gone through a lot of personal tragedy recently, especially with the death of his younger brother in tragic circumstances and that car crash, absolutely horrifying. I think most Frank Ocean fans have still got the memory of seeing a video of him kind of on the side of the street crying at the site of the crash itself and kind of weeping and stuff. And what that's done to their family could be, un you know, the words cannot describe. And I'm sure he's got his own demons he has to battle with that sort of stuff. But the lack of communication with the fans, the lack of kind of update and whatnot. And it's just, I don't know. I've, I've never been a fan of it. All that kind of, I understand some artists don't like to talk to the press, but I think you owe your fans something. The ones who kind of give you the career that you flipping enjoy to kind of give them, I don't know, just updates whenever you are planning to do something and launch something. Not everything has to be a surprise or without an announcement. That kind of mysterious thing kind of gets boring very quickly. But if he's going to be performing, if this is a mark of an album rollout coming forward, I'm all for it. Um, I'm sure the stuff he's doing with Homer and how successful that jewelry brand has been since he's kind of launched it is definitely kind of, you know, I'd assume if you're a musician, because I'd, I'd imagine designing and making stuff like that is probably way more fulfilling and less, less harder work than sitting down and trying to craft a flipping song like Pyramids or something, right? It must be excruciating to put that sort of stuff together and put together a project and especially have that and let it go to the public, right? Not have perfectionism or whatever and whatnot. But come on, man. Give us one more tape. Please give us one more tape, Frank. Give us a couple more performances. Come to the UK again. Don't cancel your gigs. Because if this is what we get going forward, it's going to be sick. But if you are planning to go to Coachella and you're going there only to see Frank Ocean, please, please use your head. Right, don't all don't only buy the ticket to see him. Also buy a ticket to see the, all the other proliferate of people that I mentioned already in the pod who are also performing. Right, there's many, many, many names on here of people that you can go and see who are also going to provide you with a good show and are definitely going to go. So don't just go just because of Frank. Um, because if he ends up cancelling, it's going to absolutely break your heart as it did when I went to Flipping Primavera with the sole intention of seeing him and he didn't go. It was obviously horrendous. But I'm happy that he's going. Cannot wait to see him perform. Hopefully, um, this set is going to be live streamed. But knowing Frank and how much of a you know a stickler he is for how things are presented and whatnot, I can assume he's probably going to be clicking X or ticking X on that box and not wanting to have his stuff put, you know live streamed on YouTube because it probably cheapens a product in his eyes. I'm 100% sure of it. I'm 100% sure of it. <laughs> I don't expect that to change. But hey, what can you do? Next on the list here, we had this pretty cool article courtesy of Mix Mag, and definitely an idea for any of you guys out there who want to give me a gift. This is definitely something I would definitely receive the open arms. I love this sort of stuff. This says, new book explores the art of nightclub design from the 1960s to the present day. And for someone like myself that's obsessed with nightlife, that's obsessed with club culture, that eventually wants to open up their own club in the future, I love looking at and watching videos of archival footage of club back in the day, how they were built, how people kind of interacted with them, the lighting um you know 
the sound design, the speakers, where the booths were, how the dance floor was put out. Like, I love all that shit. I think it looks incredible. And even more so pictures of clubs after, you know, the parties happened. I think there's one book that I've been planning to get for ages. I forgot the name of it. I think it's a German book. I think so. That highlights loads of clubs in Berlin after they kind of close on a night out and it kind of shows them, you know, covered in gunk, loads of cups and stuff all over the place. And you get to see it in the kind of bright lights. And it's kind of nice because sometimes places, like, especially like a place like Trezor, I've only ever seen in the dark, but I've only ever seen in the dark. So to see them in the light is quite nice and quite illuminating. But it's just, this is pretty cool. And I'll definitely keep an eye on this book to get it. And it says here, a new book um, from club space designer and producer, John Leo Gillen will examine the history of club, nightclub architecture and design from the 96 present day beginning with the late night spaces visited by members of 1960s new york art scene temporary pleasures looks at the distinctive design cultures in the various critical club spaces published by the press store and available from april 23rd wow it's a long time in it and the chapter each chapter focuses on different scenes the 60s radical italian clubs the new york disco detroit techno chicago house 1990s i for british rave and berlin techno all under examination oh this looks right up my alley the key rave sports clubs and super clubs and post clubs have also been looked at including new york cities the paradise garage the warehouse in chicago the abifa is amnesia trezor in berlin and the horse art social sorry the horse arts and musical festival in brussels it shows how spaces have developed throughout the years um, in response to the unique and cultural social political situation of each generation and a place for those involved in the scenes the book also includes interviews with key players in these movements including ben kelly the architect of the infamous famous manchester hort the hacienda as well as new york city uh, so as well as nyc disco dj justin strauss and dj dj ches damir Gillen, the book's author, also raised around the nightlife industry with an island via his family nightclub business. He studied for and holds a master's in imperial architecture and temporary spaces with the Elvasa from Elvisa in Barcelona. Wow, that's an amazing degree, isn't it? A degree, a master's degree in ephemeral architecture and temporary spaces. That's a fantastic title. That beats my flipping degree, right? Product design for Central St. Martins. This is definitely far better. The name Temporary Spaces, sorry, Temporary Pleasures is taken from an Instagram account of the same name where he first began archiving club spaces, which grew to become a wider project and collective architecture um, event producers and creative professionals who are exploring new ways to build spaces for more information about Temporary Pleasures and pre-order the book, visit Pretzel's website, which is there. Let's see what the cover looks like of the book, actually. Penguin in a random house picked it up but i'm definitely 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 gonna have this on my list of stuff that i want to purchase mate this looks sick temporary pleasures nightclub architecture and design and culture um uh, for the 1960s of today it's feature it's hardcover 50 dollars. yeah definitely it's up my up my lane and definitely something that i want to come and purchase so i'm definitely i'm keen to see how that progresses and going forward what else are we going to talk about here before I leave ya? Oh, let's talk about this, actually. Let's go and talk about this. So, this is a pretty cool article, courtesy of RA. And it's here. It features the headline that says, It's definitely a harder grind. Is electronic music becoming inaccessible to the working class? And obviously, being a working class individual myself, and somebody from ENDS, and somebody who definitely, I would say, occupies uh, a particular community of people who are into this sort of stuff right there's not many people out there i feel like who look like myself on the dance floor who are from the same background that i'm from who are from ends and grew up in a very rough tough neighborhood and kind of had to seek this stuff out as solace to kind of escape the mental hellhole of things i was going through day to day and kind of have a different you know attribution to that scene and what it's about and it holds a different special definitely different definitely a special place in my heart but it's also clearly things that kind of would stop certain people like myself from getting positions of like playing in certain places or you know being able to work in certain institutions just because of the level of access isn't necessarily there it's not really a it's not really an excuse but it just is what it is so it's quite cool to see these articles being put out there but i also don't want these articles to be as a a way to kind of rewrite the wrongs by having some sort of um what do you call it um what's that word called by instituting some sort of weird rep reparations or uh, whatever else to be called. I forgot there's another term for it, where you basically put things in place 
to benefit people from marginalized communities um that you know really and truly kind of further the issue because you're not really rewarding people based on their talent or based on their flipping work effort, whatever it may be called you know what i mean i don't want that to be i don't want it to be picked for a thing because i'm black or from ends that's not going to be gross but also the lack of representation in these places is a bit sad you know what i mean but it's what it is. Let's let's quickly spec over the article because I think it's really, really illuminating. It says here, um, according to new research, working class participation in the arts is on a decline. The joint study from Edinburgh, Manchester, Sheffield Universities found that the proportion of people from working class backgrounds operating in the creative industries has more than half since 1970, falling from 16.4% to just 7.9%. To be fair, that's always been the thing. Work, growing in a working class environment, especially in a working class conservative, very religious environment, you would know for the most part, it's very difficult to get your parents to agree um or to endorse or to encourage you in a career in the arts because they don't necessarily see the value in it because for the most part the most value they see in things are things in the traditional fields such as stem right but they don't necessarily see what you can gain monetarily that will take you out from the pits of poverty and give them a car or give them a new house they can't see the idea of you drawing or you play music behind a booth is going to do that sort of stuff but they definitely see a change in people's way of life and quality of life when their kid becomes a doctor when their kid becomes a nurse when their kid becomes some sort of scientist or whatever it may be called all these things definitely go law or whatever it may be called these things definitely attribute to it so this stuff is something that's happening for a long long time but i'm assuming also now going forward with this economy that we're living in as well people are generally starting to kind of you know go go away from these kind of uh, volatile industries because when the pandemic came around the first industries to really suffer were the arts right and then the last industries to, to kind of come back from it and bounce back were the arts as well so they were basically held hostage by the whims of society and by the whims of culture and by the whims of the virus and whatever else it may be called so for sure if you're somebody with a creative mindset i can understand why you'd be like you know what forget the arts let me go something traditional because i know that's guaranteed i know it's gonna be solid it continues many feel that electronic music despite its roots in queer black and latino inner city communities has also shifted towards middle class homogeneity the dj and social media commentator uh alucio wilmoth how do you, how do you say his name Alu, aluicio Will Moth, aka He Valencia, big up him. I follow him on social media, he's a good follow. Um, but these factors like declining record sales and dwindling tour revenues, how and how we've combined to make more difficult artists to make a living, having disproportionately affected those on working class backgrounds. He says, These days you've got to be able to do the whole media thing. I feel like a lot of upper class, middle class people have more money to throw parties and can pay for more stuff like PR. They can um, take the financial hit. Whereas with working class artists, the only thing we really have is our art. It's definitely a harder grind. And most of us are looking for the it moment that has the potential to pull us into visibility. Mm, I agree and don't agree. I think the idea that you need a lot of money to start parties is a bit of a mis misnomer. It's just harder to do. I was praying many, many monthly sometimes weekly parties for a very very long time it's going on for five plus years in parts of east london and south london and i was you know didn't have much money sometimes i'd be throwing those parties to make money to allow me to afford things during a week that's how bloody broke i was during those times and those parties also opportunity of course to me to kind of further my self in terms of my dj career i kind of essentially started djing because of those parties i'd put together we'd kind of you know we were sort of, sort of some of the only i think promoters at that time back then who would actually pay people we didn't even make that much money of our parties because we only got split a 10 percent split from the bar spend after they made a thousand right so it's not that much money if you imagine you know your average bar makes about 500 pounds after the cost of paying djs it's not a lot to be left with so we would still go out of our way to pay the person that we get got make, got to make the flyers we pay the djs that were playing there so after a while we we couldn't afford to keep paying everybody so we started to play ourselves and that's how i basically got to start djing I put myself in the lineup and i'll kind of play the sort of like the early set where no one was there no one really cared and then by the time the real person who we booked to come to play on the vibes were right the vibes were set they could come on smash and we kind of go home happy and we kind of did it just for the vibe just for the clout just for the notoriety of knowing oh hey i'm that person that puts that party which is absolutely sick and obviously it helped with the dj career a little bit but not really because i think a lot of people we booked to play because i think about it, looking back the people that we booked to play at our parties some of them had their own raves and they rarely if ever booked us to play their raves which is always annoying looking back on it at the time, I didn't really notice it, but there was a bit of a 
in in balance in that regard and i think maybe it becomes it's more of a dj thing and more of a clout industry thing everyone kind of is their own biggest fan everyone always thinks they're better than the next person there's not a lot of kind of cooperation collaboration and sharing everyone kind of keeps their gigs to themselves they keep their booking agents to themselves their contacts i mean there's not a lot of kind of free information sharing and kind of putting your arm around the shoulder of somebody and kind of bringing them in it's a lot of like me on my own island if i meet you there i meet you there kind of thing no one's really helping each other out like look at the girls for instance right like there are some girls out there who are helping people out but for the most part a lot of those people are just kind of dog eat dog do you know what I mean like if I'm at the top I'm at the top if you're there you're there you have to kind of figure out in your own regard so that is probably hurting it more so than ever I feel like and I feel like the PR thing that's always been a thing though isn't it I feel like that applies to all industries you have to be everything nowadays you have to be everything like I think that for the longest time I could definitely say being somebody that's black and being someone from ends I always feel like you had to kind of do a bit more to be recognized, right? You, it's kind of something you always kind of grow up with, knowing that you can't just do bare minimum. I saw this clip going viral, some kid, I don't know what his name is, he's doing a tiny desk thing and he's singing and he's doing like some weird American crappy version of the streets. Uh, this kind of like, you know, spoken word rapping kind of thing and it sounds horrible. I think I tweeted something like, oh yeah, only white people can get away with being this mediocre, right? And having a career. And that's, I think, relatively true. It's kind of difficult to just be like this kitschy, weird, awkward, you know, um, um, self-diagnosed autism type of, you know, performer and kind of make it, make it, make it work when you're from ends and you look a certain way, you kind of always have to try and do things a bit harder and a bit to another level to kind of really differentiate yourself and kind of really mark your way out of it thing so it can be difficult but i think for the most part it does serve the art it does help to kind of make the heart of a higher quality which is why most of the time myself included i feel like if given the opportunity you usually smash it because you're performing at such a high level where no one cares about you like for myself i'm thinking about it now i'm checking what is it? Yeah, let me check. Let's see. Yeah, let's just see. My SoundCloud. Look at my SoundCloud. They're checking on my SoundCloud right now, right? Live on the program. The latest mixes I put out, maybe the two latest mix, 17 days ago, 28 plays. <laughs> the one before that, 12. And I think they're of good standard. I feel like if I played these sets in a club, no one would walk out. No one would leave the dance floor. No one would be like, oh, who is that amateur behind the decks? I would sound exactly, if not better than the people that they book in these places. But am I playing there? Of course not. But because you're already performing at this level, I feel like when no one's watching you, when you get the opportunity to perform there, you end up really smashing it. So sometimes all these things that we're doing just for the art, where we're focusing on the art and we're kind of having to try harder than your regular counterparts, it kind of helps the art when you, and when you eventually have to go forward. But the idea that you need money to put on events, I think is a bit, it's a bit false. I think, you know, you can put on, again, it's more risk and it's hard to do because if anybody knows that's promoted before, you know how much of a slog it is to get people to leave their house to come to an event. It's flipping hard. Even if it's a free event, it's really difficult to do. That's why the people that are doing it at the highest level, um, people kind of run to them and try and get bookings and try and play there because they know to try and do it on their own. It's going to be difficult. So that's one thing. But I don't think price should price you out of it, to be honest. Um, it continues. Bristol DJ and producer Christian Jabs, aka Pessimist, echoes these sentiments pointing to the widening gap between rich and poor as a direct obstacle for the working class people in energy music he says if you're a young artist who happens to be from a less privileged background than you're nobody so if you're a young artist who happens to be from a less privileged background then you're probably not going to have the time to focus solely on your music because you've had work in full time meanwhile there's a lot of mediocre talent about at the moment that has been propped up by the financial backing family support and the fact that these people have the time on their hands to fully commit themselves yeah i can understand that I feel like this is where the nepotism argument comes in. I said it previously, nepotism argument shouldn't be a argument to beat these nepotism babies with a stick behind their heads because they've been granted the flipping privilege and the gift of being born into the flipping Tom Hanks's family. That's not their problems or their fault. They didn't choose their parents. It is what it is. But what I think it should do is that it should give you some respite if you are a young actor coming up you should a bit be a bit more chill and a bit more calm if one of tom hanks's kids like a chet hanks for instance is a eternal fuck up and he's still getting presented with opportunities despite all these fuck ups and maybe obvious lack of talent it should be competent to you to know that he's the son of tom hanks because then you can knock okay, it cool he's been afforded some privileges some opportunities because he's a son of tom hanks that i'm never going to get because i'm just random person working two jobs and trying to support a family cool but it means my journey will be longer 
but it also it also kind of makes me stop comparing myself to Chet Hanks because you know we're different leagues I think the same thing happened to DJ I've said it before I think there needs to be an expose and nepotism babies or privilege in general in terms of dance music industry because I think a lot of people have it confused so I think with the Peggy Goo incident is a good example the Peggy Goo story of her basically you know figuring out life in her mid-20s and living in Berlin and chilling out and hanging out sort of stuff that would give you an idea of where that journey was able to kind of her kind of you know journey to become a global superstar DJ was sort of shortened and her kind of ascent was kind of really super powered because she had these opportunities and privileges that most people don't have when you're going to Berlin for the most part you're trying to figure out how you're going to pay your rent how you're going to afford dinner how you're going to, you know, choose it between drugs and alcohol, whatever it may be. But she got the opportunity to kind of, you know, figure stuff out in the real time, work in certain places, intern, quote unquote. All these things are things that can only be afforded if you have some financial backing, some support that can make you do these decisions. And I feel like those things are good to know, not because it's cool and funny to like pick apart people and insult someone like a pay you. No, I think it's good to know so that you can stop comparing yourself and your journey. So you'd be like, okay, cool. I can see that this girl got to where she got to because of these things helped her to kind of you know pursue the arts without having the struggle and the sort of uh, weight behind her head to kind of hold on to or to afford certain things she can kind of pursue arts 100 percent i am struggling in this point because i'm having to kind of you know divide my time between working this dead-end job that i hate and pursuing the arts my journey might be a bit longer it might take me more time but i'll eventually get there but i need to stop comparing myself to her because that journey is completely different and a bit of a you know uh, it's a bit of an exception to the rule for the most part but i don't but again it doesn't excuse the position really that's not an excuse it's not for you to say oh yeah woe is me that's why i'm not there you still need to work hard and kind of you know do what you need to do on your side of things putting out the mixes releasing stuff making new records you know whatever it may be but again i think a part of it as well there's this kind of purposeful mystique around the industry right about how to get gigs how to get how to go forward that kind of doesn't help things either like who do what do you go to do you try and get a manager first do you try and get a booking agent first do you try and put out a track first do you send your demos to people do you let the people find your demos yourself do you upload mixes online do you stream them online do you put like what do you do like there's all this kind of misdirection and purposeful kind of vagueness around stuff and you know these there's a common thing here people say, especially people that made it, oh, just trust the process, it will come. With... No, 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 no. Stuff, some stuff has to happen that, that kind of gets your ball rolling. Break it down, let's be real, and let's get to the point of it. That's what can really help people. Right? People purposely kind of hide it and kind of hide their hands and hide their process because, you know, people are generally selfish and don't want other people to get opportunity because the last thing you want is to be inundated in the scene full of amazing DJs because it's going to limit your opportunities to get gigs as well because you know part of the reason why you make it is because there's loads of shit people out there who are professional so if you're half decent you're going to be able to smash it so it's a bit you know it's a bit twofold it continues Jabs recently took up work as a painter and decorator to make ends meet portrays a British sorry the Bristol scene as increasingly homogenized he says when I was coming up in around 2010 it was a night and day compared to what it's like now Bristol has become such a divided city both racially and by class and the dance music scene really reflects that Jabs blames the division on hyper gentrification insisting that for the most part dance music has been reduced to little more than commodity to the city's large uh, predominantly affluent student population therefore alienating those living outside the student bubble yeah for sure this is definitely a very unique UK problem though and I feel like I definitely understand where it's coming from but I don't think it applies globally but definitely a very unique problem I can see why hyper gentrification could push people from marginalized underrepresented um you know um, places to not maybe pursue stuff in the arts because it's so far away but i've also seen areas where for the most part you look at stuff like business techno you look at stuff like tech house even for instance and it feels like a lot of that has kind of been birthed from people from you would say the working class who have maybe you know pushed them ways up towards middle class to be represented in some way shape or form and the funny thing about that is that that is also a bit of a whitewash industry right it's a bit whitewashed it's a bit working class but it's also very different to any other scene we have here in the UK. It sort of kind of exists in its own little bubble. Um, but I definitely do see way more girls. I see definitely see way more black people. So it's a bit strange. Like you would assume a lot of those people in that industry or in that scene are probably not the most, um, you know, uh, not the most um, affable when it comes to 
the LGBTQ queer community, but they also have way more representation in their scene than we have in our quote unquote scene in techno, right? You just see the same whitewashed lineups. You see the same um, names on the places wherever they're going to play. There's not a lot of representation at all, if ever, on the lineups. It's all kind of the same old nonsense regurgitated all over again. There's not a lot of dynamism in the tracks and songs. Like it's all a bit similar, similar. But hey, what kind of? Know? It continues. Preston born artist Rainy Miller acknowledges a similar disconnect between students and the local population in his hometown. But where Bristol is renowned for its vibrant music scene, the bigger issue faced by the working class people in towns like Bristol is gaining access to culture at all. It says, realistically, outside of a metropolis, I don't see much funding or much happening in these smaller satellite towns. These places where majority of ordinary working class people live have become cultural vacuums. Accessibility wise, I think the most important thing is showing people the culture and getting them excited about it. People seemingly aren't being given the opportunity to explore these areas and a lot of the time they aren't even aware that it exists. Miller also highlighted the issue of fetishization, describing how hyper local working class cultures um subcultures are either ridiculed or ignored until they eventually co-opted by the cultural gatekeepers and repackaged to the masses of course we know that that always happens it continues look at clubs now when you hear donk is usually done unironically he explained making reference to the once derided hard house dub um long detached from its small town Lancashire like roots people view it as a joke but it's reality it's one of the only things that has been able to ferment and grow in these places it's now being sold back and almost like a commodity yeah think of possession isn't it i understand where he's coming from miller used the example of bad boys chill crew the Bradford Collective now signed Sony subsidiary Relentless Records who have offer a humorous caricature the baseline garage subculture that's originated from Yorkshire obviously sort of as a gimmick but these were lads doing the kind of thing all over the country 10 years earlier back then it weren't a joke it was what people grew up on for sure um, for Lorraine James who grew up in the Alma estate of North London imposter syndrome was the biggest obstacle she tried um, to make a name for herself in the predominantly white middle class experimental music circuit she says I didn't think I'd ever be in a position that I'm in now you just sort of do things you do you just you just sort of do these things to fail <laughs> she's speaking my language <laughs> you put it out there and it goes into the flipping dark web or into the urethra or into deep space we feel like and especially these mixes or these online streams <laughs> i think what's my online stream We've got a three hundred thousand, no 300 views or something like that you're like jesus christ what is the point but it continues even when i started bubbling up in 2018 i still feel like i was winging it i had nothing to fall back on and was basically entering the unknown you don't get a stable wage every month and i'm not from a rich background so it was really very very scary thing jade reference a sort of music equipment and soberly faced by artists who use minimal setup as additional change oh yeah don't get me started on the flipping controller vibe because who would you see in clubs with the controllers predominantly people from working class environments right that couldn't afford cdjs at home so they had to play on flipping controllers but then they get to a club they bring the controller and they'd be you know have the ravers look at them like they're flipping amateurs and have the people are playing alongside them looking at them like amateurs right so this kind of you know nonsense flipping circle is kind of being permeated by the brands themselves who are making this equipment and pricing out people like myself who are from working class environments and you have the people that are in the industry the gatekeepers upholding the standard that if you don't play on these big shit DJs and you're not a real DJ it's like go and spin on my middle finger it continues electronic artists who make a living from music tend to have thousands of pounds worth of gear at their disposal which can be pretty intimidating there's also a lot of judgment in the electronic music scene uh, over how much or little gear you have. Sometimes when I'm sound checking, I bring two MIDI controllers <laughs> with my laptop and the sound guy will look at me like, is that it? But I've always said that it's what you do with it, just work with what you've got. Of course, and that's, that's the kind of Casey Neistat um, approach. When Casey was doing his vlogs, his daily vlogs and whatnot, there'd be tons of people online, especially asking him those annoying questions about equipment, about equipment. And for the most part, I think he felt it too. They was asking these questions about equipment because I think in a weird way, it was like a backhanded compliment because it was like, oh, you're only this good because you have the best equipment. And he was like, no, 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 no. It's not the equipment. It's what you do with the equipment. This is what I use. And this is my flow. It's my process. And this is what I'm thinking of when I'm shooting certain things. But it's never about the equipment. It's about what you do with what you have. So use what you have. Don't fetishize or obsess over getting the right thing. And you'll be great. And I know for myself, I learned to DJ primarily off of belt drive CDJs. Sorry, belt drive um, turntables. I think I had like, um, what brand I had? Able, not Ableton. What's it? What they? It's a shitty brand. Uh, is it Donut or Donut? What's it called? 
I forgot the name of it, but some of you know. It's not Technics as you have one. I had those. I never owned a Technics 1210s, legit ones, never. Then I went from that to using a really shitty Newmark. I said Newmark, I think. I think a Newmark belt drives. Then I went from using a Newmark belt drive to play vinyl. Vinyls that I was buying from a charity shop and secondhand shops I was playing out sometimes. Then I'd use a flipping MIDI controller, a really old Newmark MIDI controller, like a big, massive brown, I think it was grey. I took that MIDI controller to go and play one of my first gigs that I got booked as a DJ solo by myself in the Shoreditch Art Gallery somewhere. And I think that's the same DJ gig where I played alongside <laughs> um, Crystal Clear. He was actually, he was booked at the same time as well, which is bizarre. But I was playing on these flipping big things. And I didn't have to play on CDJs before that. And that was happening crazy. Imagine playing with a flipping white MacBook with a controller, playing next to flipping Masha, um, not Masha, um, Crystal Clear crazy but anyway continues um while they're being um the article on tears here says while there have been consensus efforts to tackle dance music's lack of diversity in recent years wilmoth believes that the scene's over reliance on this diversity quotas at which at least in their current form has hindered any serious change ah oh, yes i like this our understanding of representation in politics is pretty hollow and surface level when people talk about inclusion and identity that should also include class the conversation tends to stop at race, gender, and its sexuality, but people need to realize that all these things are interwoven. But that's the issue, though, when you get into identity politics. It doesn't end. Because if you go to class, you have to then split class up because not all working class people are created equally, right? You have to then go down to do that. And you have to go down, you know, it just, it just goes, it's just too much. It's just too much. Overall, I've always said it's a real disappointment and it kind of it kind of bums you out when you start going out a lot like i do and you start to realize that for whatever reason whatever scene you're in the dance the people behind the booth usually don't represent the crowd it's really annoying and i see it a lot of times especially with stuff that i'm not into especially edm think of edm right think of all those hot girls you see in fishnet tights in leather in whatever it may be called like stunting and showing out going to edm raves going to burning man going to Tomorrowland, all these things, right? So think of all those girls. Now think of how many of those girls you've seen play behind the decks. How many of those girls are DJs and artists? How many girls get the opportunity to play warm-up sets or whatever? Not many. You see the same old white guy looking face, like, you know, I don't know what they look like, you know, that kind of haircut, whatever, with the big t-shirts and wearing Balenciagas on top of a DJ booth dancing, right? That's all you see. So for every reason, even on the most niche level, in the most underground level, the crowds never represent people behind the booths. And in the most commercial high class, commercial normie type of cringy level in EDM, the crowds don't rep are not represented in the DJ booth, which is probably why these new sort of alternative scenes and spaces pop up, especially here in the UK with, you know, Homo Tash and like um, Inferno and we're like Howl and even Pussy Palace. That's why probably those places and even stuff like, um, what's it called? Uh, um, I don't know, I've got the other ones, but there's loads of them anyway. That's why those things are probably popping up so much because they're one of the first things that we've seen that are representative of the scenes or the people that they're kind of communicating with. Like they have a lot of queer LGBTQ type people represented behind the booths. Some of them are very unknown. Some of them don't have any social media platform whatsoever. Some of them are just kind of people that just attended the raves and got friendly with the promoters and stuff or people that put their events on. So there's a clear link between it. It's all kind of it's a cyclical thing. Whereas all these other scenes, it's just the same old people, the same established name being cycled every single season. Look at Time Warp, the most boring, predictable lineup you see every single year. The same names, the same faces all the bloody time and it gets boring after a while so that kind of you know representation quota type of thing is a bit hard because diversity and representation isn't being um, seen in all of the different sort of rungs on the dance music industry in my opinion it's all kind of the same it's all vanilla it's all boring it's all crappy um, and there's no real change there's no real it feels like onus to kind of change things in general they just keep repeating the same things because it works he added for example if you're putting three minorities on a lineup with one well-established white headliner, nine times out of ten, the headliner will be earning the most and the other artists are viewed as parsley, um, sprinkled on top of a promoter's to kind of look good. Yeah, but no one's doing it still. I, don't, I can't think of the last time I've heard of a big white established headliner being supported by three people from minorities playing. It still doesn't happen that often. So even if it is done to be performative, um, it still is not happening enough. And even if it was to be happen, it wouldn't be exactly a bad thing because I don't think the opportunity to play 
is the most important thing because like i said in this industry people purposely try to obfuscate or hide the process of trying to get to the top no one really knows how to get there it's all kind of a bit misty and a bit mysterious on purpose so these things are still good in my opinion Instead, Wilmoth wants to see greater focus on policies that help minorities on a material level. He also advocates for greater transparency around artist fees and financial apparatus required to gain the foot and the scene. A lot of stuff just isn't taught. That ain't going to happen. You're not going to see people's transparency in terms of artist fees. We already see how the flipping scene went up in the uproar when that article came out about flipping Solomon and you found out that he was earning what he was earning. It's like, what, what did you expect? Solomon's one of the biggest well-known commercial DJs out there. Of course, he's going to be earning like 200, 100,000 plus as a DJ fee. That makes complete sense, especially when you can also consider on top of it, he's not even one of those kind of like, just turn up and do his thing and go. He's legitimately a fan of the music. He's, you know, he, he plays for hours on end. He's one of the most high profile people I can think of that has that old school German, European, Berlin type of mentality when it comes to DJ sets, right? Like two hours is never enough. He's going for a marathon set. So if you're a promoter, you're definitely getting your bang for your buck because you can extrapolate as much value out of him as possible to kind of get your money back from what you paid in the artist's fee. And also just from terms of a, you know, equation vibes, he definitely earns his money for the t amount of time that he plays, especially in comparison to other people who turn up for two hours, play the top 50 bangers from Beatport and then dip and still get maybe, you know, an exorbitant amount in terms of money. So I don't think those people want to be i don't think they'd want the public to know how much they get paid because people are going to require more from what they do and i also don't think the promoters want to know how much they're willing to pay these people to play at these places because it's going to throw you know it's going to skewer their whole pay structure completely so no that's not gonna happen anytime soon but what are the consequences to the scene that's risk becoming an exclusive playground for the privilege things will get very boring and formulaic says Wilmoth you can kind of see it already happening you go to TikTok and you're seeing techno artists that you've associated with more underground clubs playing alongside EDM acts at big festivals in a class in a class sense people get rewarded for buying into this very homogenized industry thing and for adhering to a certain formula and all end up sounding very familiar Sorry, very similar. There are um, there needs to be more space for the actual futurism that dance music once portrayed itself. Jabs, who according to his Twitter bio is extremely bored of dance music scene, goes one further. It's like um, it's maybe a bit of an extreme statement, but I personally don't feel like there's any interesting grassroots movements coming out of dance music at the moment. The scene has become overwhelmed with entitled people, and it's stuck in this really boring place as a result of that. That said, James thinks actually let's go on that comment. That's true. That could be said for every, every single subculture and industry and niche and scene out there. Fashion, design, art, they're all boring. They're all homogenized and they're all stale at the moment. But I think these moments are also times that you can kind of counteract and create something quite out there and something fresh and something cool that could come out of it for sure. People are going to respond to these things all the time. It gets stale, then it gets good and it gets fun once again. Just got to give it time. That said, James thinks aspiring working class artists shouldn't give up. I do think the, the electronic music scene um, is becoming more accessible. For example, every now and then you come across a huge hit that has been made by some 30 year old bedroom producer. It's an improvement for when I was at school, but at the same time, I don't think the government cares. They don't want to grant working class kids have nice things. I'm not waiting for the government to give me an excuse or to give me permission to make music personally. That's just me. And I feel like most people, most kids out there, working class kids for general, you're definitely self um self sufficient. I know I was when I was growing up. You just figure stuff out. Like I said before, I was playing alongside Master Plex or Master Plex, alongside flipping Crystal Castle, Crystal Clear. I was like, I can't even speak today. I was playing alongside Crystal Castle and lineup many years ago using a flipping DJ controller. I figured it out. And I think most kids now, especially with the accessibility of, um, you know, um, equipment out there, with places like Pirate Studios that exist that you can go and play on a professional setup similar to what you see in nightclubs and all your DJ heroes and idols playing on a weekly basis. So there are little to excuses anymore in terms of having the ability to play and access these things. Now, to get into the industry, that is still, I feel like, a gatekeepery, purposeful, let me kind of try and stand in front of this and not let people through type of thing. And I think everyone's to blame i think even the working class people who push through there's very rarely a lot of them that come back and sort of like offer their hand and pull people up you don't see that happening too often i don't know why that is but for every reason you don't really see a lot of the arm around the shoulder of somebody to kind of bringing them through there's a lot of kind of me on my own i do my thing if i got my label i bring people through but it's very much like me my own person me my own hero type of vibe and especially like i said with the ladies you see a lot of the ladies like think of some of the biggest girls out there especially within the techno underground type of scene there's a lot of them on their own 
there's not a lot of them you know rolling around in crews in kind of collectives and stuff it's all solo dolo girls like behind the decks with their little arms waving around the air having a good time but they're very rarely bringing together or bringing up uplifting these women voices who clearly need the attention on them when you think about how you know dominated male you know male of male DJs are in the industry overall so it's definitely an issue being affected everywhere altogether if anything there should be more kind of clarity more transparency in terms of how to get the gigs how to go forward and these type of things but there should be more work as well done by the clubs themselves to kind of you know um establish and kind of pull in people who are maybe not that well known and kind of get them involved and kind of get into play you look at places like fold for instance that's around the corner from where i live and they do a really good job of kind of getting their local community involved with the stuff they do with unfold i still think they should be doing more i look me myself like you know i'm from flipping canning town and custom house and i've never played there and that place is legitimately five minutes away from where i I was bloody born and i'm sure there's many people out there as well that have, you know that are from the area that would love a chance to play those type of places and you don't instead they fly over people from other countries to come and play which is a bit annoying but at least they're doing something with that regard you see fabric doing the same thing with their resident dj they're trying to do something but more needs to be done and i feel like it needs to it's a collective effort it's not everybody's it's not it's not one person's fault but everybody needs to kind of play a part in it to kind of make the scene fresh again. But I still think even if no one does that and everyone holds their hands, you know, um, hold, holds their hands or put their hands in their pockets and doesn't open up doors and stuff, I still think the kids will respond and they'll figure a way out and they'll figure a way through and they'll figure a, a, a solution because it always happens. Every single generation, every single era we see it, it stagnates, it gets boring, it gets crappy and the kids burst through regardless because that's what kids are meant to do. Meant to figure out, especially if you've got a passion for something, you definitely definitely figure it out and find a way to carve yourself a lane in those situations i know i'm trying to do so in my own regard i'm sure people are doing do so in their own regard also going forward so it's cool to see these conversations being highlighted and put out there but i don't want them to be like an excuse to not to try and to throw your hand up in the air and say what's the point because i don't have any rich parents because you can still make it forward you can still make it through it just requires a little bit more hard work a little bit more dedication a little bit more insights in it but you can do it you can do it Anyway, that's been the Excellent Show, episode number 639. Thanks again for tuning in. It's been a pleasure to have your company as per usual. If it's the first time you're tuning into a show, you know what to do. Slash like it, subscribe, leave a comment down below. If you listen to the audio version of the show, you hear my tune of the day. If you're listening, to, if you're watching, sorry, to the video portion of the show, you won't see anything. Of course, as per usual, if you want more information regarding myself, check out my site, excellentzinger.com down below. You can find out things regarding myself, um, the show, whatever it may be. You can contact me on there as well and on my social media points if you want to ask questions and i'll see you guys again very very soon but until then take care be safe peace